Good morning and a very warm welcome to this uh, info day uh, for the second call for the small scale projects under the Innovation Fund, uh, the brand new call that we launched last week and that will close on the 31st of August with a budget of 100 million euros dedicated to support uh, clean tech projects with the capital expenditure of up to 7.5 million euros. I'm very glad that uh, we can meet today and uh, uh, walk you through the whole day uh, of uh, information related to the call, uh, uh, to its substance, to its conditions, and the way how you can use all the information that we have prepared for you today, and we hope you will use it uh, very efficiently. My name is Roman Dobrava. I am the uh, uh, head of unit of the Innovation Fund uh, team in CINEA, in Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency of the European Commission. And with me today, there is the team of people uh, who were behind the preparation and will be behind the management of this call going forward. Um, many of the people you don't see, they sit in the back, in the, uh, back of the room, but there is quite a crowd today to support us, support you to answer any questions you may have during the day. So I have the pleasure to welcome you uh, and, uh, and moderate this morning session. We have quite a busy agenda for today. Uh, as you can see on the slide, in the morning we will have the introductory presentations. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, we have Stefan Fergote, who is the head of unit uh, uh, responsible for the Innovation Fund in DG Klima, uh, who has a very busy aden agenda nevertheless made it and uh, is here today with us. And then uh, we will have uh, uh, in the second part the team of the Innovation Fund presenting uh, all the aspects of the, of the Innovation Fund call. Uh, we have Marion, we have Laura, Gianluca, Susanna, Christoph, and Johanna that will be presenting you the, the respective uh, award criteria as we will be going forward. We have two Q&A sessions uh, in which we will answer those questions that you pose in Slido that will be the most relevant. Otherwise, all the questions that you, you will pose in Slido, we will try to answer as we will go. Then we have a lunch break, and in the afternoon we will have a dedicated sessions, mini sessions, on specific parts uh, on the greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, calculation methodology related to different sectors in which your projects may be placed. You see on the slide the timing, and dependent on where your project may be placed, you are more than welcome to connect again and to follow uh, the presentations and uh, the discussions that will be related to specific parts of this methodology. So very, very busy day ahead of us. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, let's just uh, uh, say a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping messages. So please uh, connect to Slido. You can see on the screen the hashtag that uh, relates to this event. It's the Innovation Fund Small Scale Call 2021. That's the site where you can pose your questions and we will try to answer them. Those that will be most relevant, we will answer uh, uh, live, live uh, um, orally in the panel. Otherwise, we will be trying to answer your questions uh, throughout the day. Uh, at the end of the, of the day, please don't forget to fill in the survey that we prepared for you. It is very important for us to analyze the quality of this event, to receive your feedback and improve for uh, future. One more um, uh, announcement. Uh, your project-specific questions that are very technical, very specific, uh, those uh, we ask you to pose in our help desk, and we will show in the next slides where you can find it. Uh, also, the, the specific questions related, for instance, to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, relevant costs, and so on, we will try to answer them in the respective part of the presentations today. Otherwise, we will try to answer all other questions as we go forward. I hope this is quite clear, and I didn't forget to say anything from the housekeeping point of view. So without further delay, I, I would be very happy to pass the floor to Steph. Uh, to give you some introduction from DG Klima about the Innovation Fund and policy context. Steph. Thank you, Roman, and uh, good morning, everybody uh, across Europe, uh, to this uh, info day on the, on the small scale uh, call under the Innovation Fund. So, my name is indeed uh, Stefan Vergote. I'm the, since beginning of this year, uh, head of unit uh, for the unit dealing with the Innovation Fund. 
very excited that, about this because as an engineer, I'm, I'm really interested uh, to help fostering clean tech innovation in Europe and uh, very much looking forward with all of you to, to make that mission happen. Um, I will give you a bit of a co policy context uh, and also the general setup of the Innovation Fund if you, if you are not yet uh, familiar with that. And of course, the Innovation Fund is, is part of our policy mix uh, in the context of European efforts uh, to go towards climate neutrality uh, as part of global efforts uh, to meet the goal of the Paris Agreement to limit global temperature change to below 1.5 degrees. Um, the EU leaders, the, EU leaders uh, the heads of state, have adopted a couple of years ago the goal to achieve climate neutrality in Europe by 2050, and that is now also enshrined in European law uh, with the so-called climate law. So um, there's, um, and also under this commission, I would like to say that uh, climate change and climate action is a, a very high priority. What you see in this slide is actually uh, uh, the result of some modeling work we have done, economic analysis on how to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. On the left-hand side, uh, the, em the historic emissions are depicted until 2020, where you see that emissions have decreased by approximately 30% until 2020. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see that uh, different sectors, whether it's uh, power sector, transport, industry, uh, how those emissions can be reduced over time. Uh, in a 2050 perspective. A very important milestone in, in that transition is of course 2030, where uh, the Commission has proposed uh, a package of measures and legislation to achieve a reduction of 55% already in 2030. Uh, it relates of course to the emission trading system, the effort sharing, the sector's uh, targets for member states, legislation relating to CO2 and cars, le legislation relating to renewables and energy efficiency. So a raft of um, policy proposals that are currently being discussed in Council and Parliament, and that will help us uh, to achieve that minus 55% in a 2030 perspective. But what this modeling also shows is that over time we will increasingly need technologies and solutions that are not yet fully mature, that are not yet commercially available. And that, I think, is where the Innovation Fund steps in, where we can bring innovations, what I would call, from, from lab to fab, where innovations that are not yet fully ready, uh, that we can demonstrate them at scale and indeed bring them closer to market, to market readiness. And that will be increasingly important over time in 2025, 2030, those solutions are included in this kind of modeling to actually help achieve climate neutrality. So it has a very specific, uh, the Innovation Fund has a very specific mission to help that achieving that, uh, those cost reductions and that uh, technological maturity in, in, in particular in hard to decarbonize sectors. So the scope of the Innovation Fund is enshrined in the ETS, uh, in the EU emissions trading legislation. And basically it covers four areas. First of all, innovative renewable energy, uh, so I would say not conventional uh, deployment of, of existing renewable technologies, but innovative renewable technology, including also the manufacture of important components uh, of uh, uh, renewable energy technology. Secondly, energy intensive industries and the substitute of products, so uh, products that can help uh, substituting very uh, CO2 intensive products. Carbon capture use and storage, um, and finally, also energy storage, including also there the manufacturing of, uh, of, of components. So a broad area, but uh, areas that are all very important in, in the context of solutions that are needed to move towards uh, climate neutrality. So I was mentioning already what is the, the unique selling point of the Innovation Fund. What you see here is basically the innovation chain, if I can call it that way, going from uh, basic research uh, towards uh, full commercial uh, readiness. Uh, Horizon Europe and, European, and within that European Innovation Council are examples of funding programs we have uh, to support uh, basic research and, and innovation. Uh, on the right hand side you see things that uh, programs like Connecting Europe Facility and Invest EU uh, that is helping more on projects which are uh, I would say have a high commercial readiness level and the Innovation Fund is really 
the funding instrument in between that can uh, bring projects that uh, towards a high technological readiness level, but we still have low commercial readiness level. So it is that that what we are trying to achieve uh, to bring uh, technologies closer to market. So a few key features. Um, I mentioned before that the, that the Innovation Fund is working under the uh, ETS, under the em Emissions Trading System. Under the Emissions Trading System, over a period of, of 10 years, in this decade, 450 million allowances have been set aside to finance uh, the Innovation Fund. And uh, with current prices of 75 euros per ton of CO2, that uh, adds up to approximately 38 billion euros, so a very important uh, uh, funding instrument um, we see here. We have annual calls for small scale and, and large scale calls. Uh, today we are uh, having the info day for the, for the small scale call. And that means that projects have a capex uh, below 7.5 million euros. And we can support up to 60% of that capex. In terms of the payments, 40% uh, of the grants can be dispersed at financial close and 60% of the grant dispersed during the construction and the three years of operating period um, against uh, the greenhouse gas avoidance, the actual functioning of, uh, of the project. Uh, special is also that we can have uh, single applicants, uh, but of course consortia are also very much welcome. And we have also uh, a uh, project development assistance for projects who do not make it, who are actually not uh, awarded a project, but which have potential, so that we can, we can uh, further improve the project pipeline uh, towards uh, future calls. So that uh, project development assistance is, is governed by the EIB. Um, we have uh, gone through the first uh, uh, complete evaluation of uh, the first large-scale call, and here you see an overview of um, the projects that have been uh, funded so far and for which grant agreements have been signed. So 30 grant agreements have been signed for projects and the blue uh, uh, projects or projects that have been awarded project development assistance in total 10 projects. And what you see is that we have um, quite a broad range of sectors. So in that sense, we are certainly successful to, to reach the entire scope of uh, what is eligible under the Innovation Fund. We also see the geographical spread of the projects. There, uh, the Innovation Fund has the clear objective uh, enshrined in EU legislation to have a broad coverage across all EU member states uh, and EA countries. Uh, with the first call, we already see quite a broad, uh, good broad coverage, but we also see that uh, a number of countries, in particular in South southern Eastern Europe, are still missing, so we hope uh, certainly that uh, over time uh, we can further improve that, uh, that situation. In terms of the award criteria, uh, not much new compared to the previous call. Uh, we have five criteria which are enshrined also in the Delegated Act uh, of the Innovation Fund. Greenhouse gas emissions avoidance, degree of innovation, uh, that's what it's all about. Project maturity, that is key, because uh, we want projects to fund, we want to fund projects that are, have a high level of uh, project maturity, that are well prepared, that are ready to go, uh, and can be implemented in practice. Scalability and, and cost efficiency. Now there is one uh, quite important uh, change compared to the previous call, and that is that the geographical reference point uh, to define state of the art uh, under the degree of innovation is now the, well, the, the, the reference point is actually the country where the project is located. And we hope that this uh, feature will also help uh, to further foster the geographical uh, balance within, within the innovation fund. So finally, um, the key features of this call. Uh, we are very happy to work together with all the colleagues of Cinea who will of course in charge of, uh, as executive agency for, the, for organizing the evaluation of, of this call. Um, the call has been launched on the 31st of March of 2022, and the deadline for submissions is the 31st of August. We have a volume of 100 million euros available, and the results of the evaluation would be available for, by February 2023. 
with a grant agreement signature uh, expected by May next year. For projects that would not make it to, the, to, uh, to actually being funded, uh, we have foreseen uh, a window for project development assistance. Uh, projects which have high potential but which are not yet mature enough in particular for, for, going, uh, for receiving a grant. And there we can support up to 20 projects where also the results will be available in the second quarter of 2023. And finally, um, you will find on the web also uh, a self-check questionnaire. So for everybody who is interested uh, in, this, um, uh, in this call, uh, this is a, a small self-test to see how, if, you, if your project fits into the scheme, uh, how well you are scoring in terms of the, uh, the eligibility and, and the criteria that are being used for evaluate your project. So this can be a help for you uh, to do yourself in order to, uh, to check how well you fit into the program. But of course, also during the course of the day, uh, this is a real opportunity for all of you uh, to ask questions, to get informed about the call in all its details. So um, uh, of course, use this day as well uh, to get as, uh, the best possible prepared for your application. So with that, I would like to give the floor back to Roman. Um, I wish you a very constructive and productive day. I'm afraid I will not be able to stay long, but uh, you are in the hands of very capable hands of the team of Roman and, uh, and myself with uh, Marion. So uh, I give the floor now to Roman. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steph, for, for this um, uh, overview and introduction, also highlighting um, uh, the, the new features of the call, the fact that we are really looking for uh, wider geographical uh, coverage uh, already in this second call, and we hope that we will get many, many good projects coming from the countries where we haven't been covering them so far very well. Now, I would like to uh, t take you through the main features of the call, um, uh, but before doing that, maybe we can take a quick look back into the first call, and uh, you will find a lot of information that we have already placed on our website. Uh, we have uh, produced the lessons learned, the statistics. Marion will present the self-check questionnaire for you. So please have a good look there because there is a lot of information about the projects, about the key issues, about the scoring, about the main elements of success or failure. But all in all, just to uh, making the, the picture of the previous call. So we had um, uh, 32 projects that were selected at the end. 30 have signed the grant agreement. And uh, what we saw in the previous call is that there was quite a long list of very innovative, very good projects, which some of didn't make it through, and didn't make it through mostly because of the two main areas where we see a significant place, significant area for improvement. One uh, uh, being the, uh, the degree of innovation, so the way how the projects presented their technology, how well they justified why this particular solution is really innovative or not. So this is the place where we also uh, uh, made changes in the context um, uh, and in the framework so that you have a better chances now. As well, uh, the second area, project maturity, where we see many projects failing, whether on technical or financial uh, financial maturity, again, a space where there is a possibility to present and design your project that will be more convincing to the evaluators. We have done a lot of work in this area as well for you. We have prepared new forms and the ways that will also ease your calculations and reasoning, and uh, Christophe and colleagues will present this for you later on. But all in all, what we saw is that there is a big pipeline of very good projects, and we hope that we will see many of those in this call. Uh, this is just a picture from the first uh, signature ceremony of the first three small-scale projects. Uh, but all in all, in 30 projects that we have signed, we are covering very wide area of technologies, of solutions. And this is maybe one of the uh, key features, um, uh, key, key benefits of the Innovation Fund, as we are covering a covering wide variety of technologies, wide variety of sectors. Uh, uh, we are also... Uh, uh, technology uh, and uh, business design agnostic. So it is up to you to present what you want to do. We are not regulating this. We are very eager to support any new innovative technologies or solutions that are there. We are here to address the risk 
finance gap. So those, this, that part of the financing, which is difficult to obtain on the market from your shareholders, from your lenders, or any other support, we are covering up to 60% of your capital expenditure, which is an important injection that may attract additional financing. And I think this is an important element that we are bringing in, in support of the projects that we would like to, we would like to see. We have quite a robust and relatively fast way um, uh, and system from call launch until the grant signature in, in terms of how other EU programs are managed. Uh, and this is also improving over time. We are learning from our own experience, from your experience. We are trying to get these processes up and running faster and more robust. Uh, and then also, uh, if your project is selected, um, we will not check your invoices. We will check your results. This is an important element of the Innovation Fund that needs to be considered because we want to see what you do and not really every single nut and bolt that you are financing. So we are striving to support projects that can become innovation and business leaders on the market to lead the pack. And we, are also, uh, li we would like to see projects that have good potential to upscale, replicate and hit more places in Europe. Steph already mentioned the key, uh, key uh, features of the call, so I will not repeat this. Uh, 100 million euros at your disposal, uh, projects up to 7.5 million euros of capex. We are lump sum financing framework, so this means we cover up to 60% of your capital expenditure. And how this works in practice is shown on this picture. Uh, we cover up to 40% up to of the grant that we provide to you that we can pay at or before financial close. And this is always at the milestones that need to be agreed and that are given. So we have two key milestones, financial close and entry into operation that are asked from every single project. All the other milestones and steps in your project, we call them work packages, are to be designed by you, reflecting the logic of your project. And then during the operation, we have three uh, regular milestones or work packages that relate to three years of operation where we will check your greenhouse gas emissions. So if we pay 40% at or before financial close, this 40% is not related to the greenhouse gas emissions that you achieve or not. The rest of the funding, the 60% of the grant, is disbursed after the financial close, during the construction, during the three years of operation, and that part will depend in total on the, on the greenhouse gas emissions achieved, where we will be checking how much of the emissions are you reducing compared to what you have proposed when you came to our call. So this gives a lot of flexibility to you, to applicants, to design your project that fits best to your needs, to your market segment, to your business logic, uh, to the way how you are structuring and designing your consortium or your case. There are some checkpoints in the, in the framework that are regulated, the financial close, the entry into operation, and the overall 40, 60% disbursement of the grant. And what we check is what you achieve, whether you deliver your work packages, what you have proposed, and whether you deliver your greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? So that is the lump sum framework in which the Innovation Fund operates. Now, on the award criteria, Steph mentioned we have the same five criteria as we had in the previous call that you may be already very well aware of. What we have tried to do in this call, again, learning from the experience from you, from our evaluations uh, in the previous call, is that we slightly modified the sub-criteria. Okay, so now we have, again, the degree of innovation. This is the same. We are looking for projects that go beyond the state of the art and beyond the incremental innovation. Under the greenhouse gas emissions, we have added one more sub-criterion. So we have absolute and relative greenhouse gas emissions, and we have quality of greenhouse gas emissions calculations, minimum requirements, net carbon removals, other greenhouse gas emissions savings. And this is added to make sure that we bundle all elements related to greenhouse gas emissions calculations on the single criteria, okay? So that we don't pollute other areas of your project, but really have a thorough assessment of the calculation and uh, deliver one score related to this. Then we have a project maturity uh, to make this aligned also to the large scale call. And we saw that it may be also easier for you to present the different aspects of your project. We have now the three sub criteria there, technical, financial, and operational maturity. And again, this gives the space to you as applicant to present those areas that relate to your project because they are relevant for every single investment. 
how far are you ready from the technical point of view to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that you propose, how far your financial structure is robust and prepared going forward and meet the financial close within four years and then enter into operation, and then how far are you prepared to actually deploy your technology, your project on the market in the time that you are proposing in your application. The scalability criterion has been simplified, so we have the three areas that we are still following, the scalability at the regional level, at the sector level, and economy-wide, but these are no more three sub-criteria that are scored separately. We bundle them under a single criterion. Again, this gives you more flexibility to present your case, to build your case dependent on who you are, where you are, and where your scalability actually comes. And Susanna will present this later on today. And finally, under cost efficiency, we have again created one more sub-criterion. So we have the famous cost efficiency ratio, which is the grant uh, compared to um, the greenhouse gas emissions that you are delivering. But we also added a small point where we check whether the quality and, and the uh, credibility of the cost calculations are in line with what we can actually finance, so the relevant cost. And again, this allows us to bundle these points under a single point and have uh, a more consistent, more, more holistic evaluation for you. So all in all, what we have tried to do here is to create more space to present the elements of your project in the distinct five areas, which are balanced out. So if you are very innovative and more risky, this will be balancing out those that are probably less innovative but more eager and faster in deployment. And all in all, these five criteria should allow us to balance all these differences in a very thorough, fair, and transparent evaluation system. Uh, this uh, time, which, uh, uh, but I think we had the also in the previous call, we will be going through a cascade type of evaluation. So first we look, obviously, in the eligibility and admissibility, whether you are fulfilling all the, uh, the administrative and, um, and legal requirements for the call. Then we will assess the degree of innovation. If the projects fail to meet the minimum requirements, the minimum threshold, we stop the evaluation. And in your evaluation report, you will have only the evaluation of this particular criterion and where we saw the issues. Then we, go move, then we move forward to next uh, two criteria, greenhouse gas emissions avoidance and project maturity. Again, if all the requirements are not met, then we stop the evaluation. And in your report, you will see degree of innovation and those two uh, uh, criteria assessed and with recommendations or with, with the judgment of the, of the evaluators. And those projects that pass all three first areas will then be assessed against the scalability and cost efficiency criterion. So this is the, the, uh, the cascade approach. And uh, also maybe here uh, what has changed compared to the previous call in terms of the scoring system. We have tried to simplify the whole framework. You may remember the very complicated evaluation report that you received, which was also based on the way how our systems operate in designing these um, uh, reports. So we have tried to look into this. The fundamentals did not change. Okay? We have increased the maximum score from 5 to 15. But this means that we will, we, we will do no more normalization, as we call it. We will score under each criterion up to 15 points. These are divided then where relevant, as you see on the slide, uh, on the slide to the sub-criteria. So we increased the, the framework for assessment. This gives more space also to the evaluators to make their judgment. But the relative shares of the different criteria, the relative shares of sub-criteria are not changed. Okay? So again, the scoring change is there to make the evaluation report clearer, more straightforward, more understandable for you, and on the other hand as well to give a bit more space to the evaluators to make the judgment with a more space to place the project according to where you are and then attribute the scores. And again, colleagues will maybe show this later today to you. I hope this was clear. Now on the selection procedure, um, it's the same as we had it in the previous small scale call. We have a single stage. After admissibility and eligibility, we will evaluate it, all the criteria under all submissions. This is done by the external evaluators. We will have six people evaluating every single proposal. 
to technical experts, to financial experts, and to greenhouse gas emission experts. Again, trying to, to make sure that this is completely impartial, transparent, and, and fair. After uh, the evaluators make their judgment and the evaluation is concluded, uh, there is a list of pre-selected projects which is consulted with the member states, both in terms of those projects that are recommended for funding, those that are pre-selected, those projects that were not making it through the project maturity criterion, and again, we will get there when presenting bits, a bit more of the project development assistance, so those projects that are okay from all the other uh, award criteria but do not score enough to pass the threshold under uh, project maturity may be recommended for the project development assistance and again they are put on the list which is consulted with the member states and after that consultation we either award the grant and start the, the grant, uh, grant um, agreement preparation or uh, the EIB does a second assessment of the projects that are recommended for the PDA and after that the commission takes the financing, deci the, the, the award decision and the projects are signing their project development assistance grant um, uh, support with the EIB, European Investment Bank, who then provides the capacity and the knowledge to these projects to improve forward. So that's the selection procedure. I think it's, uh, it's, it is quite clear. And uh, maybe some recommendations. I don't want to spend more time here. It is quite, quite uh, self-explanatory. Uh, there is a lot of material prepared for you whether on the funding and tenders portal related to the call text, please read all the documents thoroughly, whether it is the call, whether it is the application form, the methodologies that we have placed on the website, but also please have a look to other materials that we have made available for you, whether they are coming from the previous call, the lessons learned, uh, the, the statistics, uh, check your self-check questionnaire, whether your project is, let's say, well-placed for the innovation fund or not yet or not at all. Uh, and please watch also the videos and webinars that we have done previously. There is really a lot of knowledge out there and use it to your benefit. Uh, it is important that you start your preparations early. Don't leave this to the last minute. We have seen in the previous calls that there were hiccups, there may be IT hiccups in the system and it's really bad if you do not uh, manage to submit your call because this is done very last moment and your, 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 your project is not admit, admitted. Use the help desk that we have prepared for you. Uh, if you have project specific questions, don't hesitate to use it. We will try to answer all the questions back so that you have um, uh, clarity going forward in preparing your application. I think you will see more recommendations uh, related to different criteria from, from colleagues. And uh, now just uh, a highlight on what is ahead of us. So we are uh, preparing next large scale call uh, still this year in autumn. Uh, again, this will be evaluated and uh, we do expect the results in autumn 2023. The amount of the call uh, is not yet confirmed, but uh, we, can, we can probably expect that there will be more funding for this large-scale call in this autumn. And the next small-scale call we will have probably in the spring of next year. So we are uh, following up with this spring-autumn rhythm for uh, small and large-scale projects every year in order to speed up and in order to give as much support as possible to the portfolio of projects being formed or being created. And the last message, message from me in this blog, uh, we are always looking for experts, uh, for experts that will help us evaluate the proposals. We will launch the new campaign uh, soon. Uh, we are looking for technical uh, experts, greenhouse gas emissions experts, financial experts, but also for rapporteurs and quality checkers. So people who are capable of drafting, capable of putting complex information in the, into simple form and, uh, and uh, write in a, in a very high quality. So if you are such experts, if you know people who could be relevant, whether it is from academia, whether it is from uh, think tanks or the market, do not hesitate to pass the word, and we are very, very keen to see more applications coming in. And that's, uh, I think, it from, from me in this blog, and uh, I'm very happy to, to welcome Marion Perel from, uh, from DG Klima, who will walk you through the self-check questionnaire and uh, other support that we have for you in uh, relation to the small-scale call. Marion. 
Thank you very much, Roman, and uh, good morning, everyone. Indeed, uh, in the last part of uh, this, uh, this session, I will present two different tools that we are offering to um, support potential applicants that are potentially interested in our fund, in particular the small-scale um, uh, call for proposals, namely the self-check questionnaire, a new tool that was just launched, and also um, the NER 300 financial advisory support service. So I will start with the self-check um, questionnaire that was briefly introduced by Steph. In um, two words, basically, the objective of this self-check questionnaire is to provide potential applicants, so project promoters that have already a quite a developed project ID that could be interested in our fund, to assess whether their um, chances of success under the Innovation Fund are high or not. So it is designed as a tool to provide early high-level orientation on the potential su suitability of their projects for the Innovation Fund. Of course, here I need to uh, mention an important um, warning that this tool, of course, does not replace evaluation because if um, project promoters eventually make the decision to apply, then, of course, their application and their project will be assessed thoroughly by independent evaluator. The focus of this self-check questionnaire is on small-scale uh, projects um, only. And through this questionnaire, we will assess two di different dimensions of um, your project. First, the questionnaire will assess whether your project is fit for the, um, the scope of the Innovation Fund, and second, whether your project is um, ready, in other terms, mature enough, um, compared to um, the um, expectations of the, of the Innovation Fund. And once you have filled up this uh, questionnaire, you will receive tailored feedback uh, based, of course, on the, the, the replies that you introduced into the form and some links to uh, relevant references and uh, resources for you to make an informed decision whether applying at this point in time to uh, the fund is worth the effort and energy. So the tool is already up and running and available online and you can check it out and, um, and, and, and fill, it, fill, it, fill it out at the link that you can see on, on the current slide. With the next slide, I will quickly walk you through uh, the different um, dimensions of this questionnaire. So in fact, there are three steps um, to, to fill out when you decide to introduce, um, well, to, to, um, to self-assess a project um, that, you, that, you, that you may have. The first step is dedicated to um, some basic information about your company, about the type of project, and we don't ask you for any nominative um, in, uh, information, so we will not ask you the name of your company, we will not ask you any contact details, any address. This is really for us to um, understand the type um, of projects and companies that could be um, interested um, in our fund, also to help us um, better tailor our, our policy response um, to this. And we, we are not, well, in total, uh, for this self-check questionnaire, we are not asking more than 22 questions, and I promise that it will not take you more than 10 minutes to, to fill out, especially as you can see the questions are quite, are quite basic and easily um, answered. So in the second step, um, we ask you questions regarding to the fitness of your projects for the fund. And here, these, this is a set of questions related to um, the um, uh, ability of a project to reduce greenhouse gases emissions compared to a more conventional technology, um, but also of um, the degree of um, uh, innovativeness of um, your project and also the potential of your project to scale up uh, beyond the, the pure boundaries of, um, of, of the project at a given point in time. And then finally, the third step um, of this uh, questionnaire is how ready your project is at the current juncture for the Innovation Fund. And here we ask you a set of questions related to 
um, the maturity uh, of um, your project. Once you have filled out all these different um, questions, you get um, a tailored uh, feedback and results, um, like on this uh, example um, that is currently shown on the slide. So you basically get a, um, a score for the fitness of your project. Um, so you can basically get a score between one building block and three building blocks, and the same um, for the uh, readiness dimension. So here, for instance, on the example that is shown on the slide, it is the example of the project that is apparently super fit for the Innovation Fund, so very innovative, um, with a very strong ability to reduce greenhouse gases emissions compared to conventional technology in a given sector, but most likely is not yet uh, ready to apply and probably needs to um, take steps to mature more before it stands good chances of success in the context of the fund. So if a project gets such a result, it, the advice would be at some, at some stage there are high chances that this project could become successful under the Innovation Fund, but right now may not be the good moment to, um, to introduce an application. And if this is the case, and this makes for a nice transition to the second tool that um, I would like to mention um, today, then there are other uh, possibilities than the Innovation Fund to help um, your project become more mature. And more specifically, I would like to say a few words about the NER 300 Financial Advisory Support Service, which is a tool developed by the European Investment Bank and by the European Commission to help um, projects, well, innovative projects, which also have an important ability to reduce greenhouse gases uh, emissions emission, but which are at an early stage of, um, of, their, of the project development, and to help them prepare for commercial, commercial rollout. So, th so this is a service which is really uh, dedicated to help projects improve their bankability, so it's really focused, the service that you can receive through this instrument is focused on financial advice for free. In, uh, and the, the type of services that can be received by project is tailored to the specific needs of the project. The eligible sectors are um, the same as in the context of NER 300, so they are very also very close to the, to the Innovation Fund, with the exception of energy-intensive industries. So it's renewable energy, which includes also renewable hydrogen, carbon capture, use and storage, and finally, smart energy system and energy storage. There is also a pre-assessment questionnaire in the context of this, uh, of this tool to basically assess whether the, the sector um, of your project is eligible in the context of this, um, of this support service. And another important um, piece of information is that this uh, service is um, available now, but it will not, be, uh, in, will not continue to be available for long. So if interested, please um, apply um, now or in the coming month, because it will be possible to introduce an application only um, until September um, 2022. And you can apply uh, very simply by uh, email, by sending an email to the email address that um, you see on the slide, and the support is, accept is, is provided to, to beneficiaries on a first-come, first-served basis, so there are not uh, any calls for proposals that are, that are being um, organized in the context of this instrument. I will leave it at that um, for these two tools, and I think we can now move on to um, the Q&A session, which uh, I'm, I actually happen to moderate. So um, uh, I will address the questions either to Roman or actually to myself, <laughs> if, um, if, if relevant. So let's see, um, let's see what kind of questions we have here. So you should uh, now see the first, the first uh, question to be asked on the screen. So we had an, an anonymous participant which asked us, do you plan in the future to co-finance the projects connected with circular economy but not developed by 
um, energy intensive industries and do you plan any changes in the program? So I will answer that from when if that's if that's fine with you because it's more uh, related to to policy development of the of the of the fund. So um, when it comes to el uh, eligible activities under the fund, we are basically um, bound by our legal framework and we cannot finance activities which uh, would not be linked to uh, the sectors that are mentioned in our legal base. So that basically means that um, projects which have a circular economy angle to them are very welcome, uh, of course, to apply. And this is also an important dimension that is also being assessed in particular in the context of calls dedicated to large-scale um, projects. Um, however, if your project is not linked to one of the eligible sectors, um, like energy intensive industries, for instance, then it, um, well, the, your project uh, runs the risk of not um, being eligible. Then second part of the question, do you plan any um, changes in the project? in the program, sorry, if I remember well the question that, w that was shown previously. Well, here I would like to mention, um, well, two, two important um, aspects um, surrounding the development of the Innovation Fund. For the first one is the Repower EU communication, which, as you know, was adopted by the communication back um, uh, in March this year, which, um, of course, provides um, quite some um, food for thoughts in terms of where the fund should go in the current um, geopolitical context. So, of course, we are reflecting uh, following the adoption of this communication, for instance, on how to speed up um, the implementation of the fund, how to make sure that we use the fund as best as possible to um, have fast deployment of really the technologies that are super useful in this in this very specific geopolitical context that we are in. And then the second element of um, policy context that I would like to mention is the ongoing revision of the EU uh, emissions trading uh, system directive, which um, as many of you uh, I'm sure already know, also provides um, some opportunities to open up the scope of the Innovation Fund, in particular to mechanisms such as carbon contract for difference. The next question I would like to address to Roman, um, and this question is the following. Can a project be limited to the deployment of an add-on unit into an e-fuels installation that is under construction? The full plant has a capex which is beyond 7.5 million, but the unit is below 7.5 7 million of capex. Yeah, I think that uh, the conditions for the small-scale coal are quite clear. Uh, uh, you should not uh, uh, salami slice your investment to make it fit the 7.5 million capex. If you have such a large-scale projects, I would rather consider that you apply in the, sm the large-scale coal where this would be far more relevant. Uh, it's important that you propose a project that is well-defined in its boundaries, it's complete, and at the end of the day, it has an economic sense on its own. It has to be st self-standing investment that will also generate revenues in order to repay your investment. So I think this is quite, quite clear an answer. So the next question um, is a, another eligibility question and relates to whether the fund, um, the innovation fund small scale can support projects related to hydrogen re refueling stations infrastructures. So yes, in principle, it would be possible to, to, to support refueling stations infrastructure for hydrogen, but of course you need to take into account that the project has to be innovative, otherwise it will not stand uh, chances um, of being selected, but also that um, the, um, the project needs to demonstrate its ability to reduce greenhouse gases emissions and significantly reduce these emissions. Therefore, uh, only uh, low carbon or green uh, hydrogen could be, uh, could be supported. And I suggest that we leave it at that for the Q&A because I see that we are already running nine minutes um, out of time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Marion, also for taking, uh, taking the, uh, the, the asking the questions. And I hope that there are more questions going on uh, on Slido, and we are really trying to answer those. So I think we should move forward. Um, 
and uh, go uh, ahead with the presentations. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the, the whole team of, uh, uh, of CINEA colleagues have joined us um, from, from different, uh, different parts, different teams, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we can move now with the different elements of the call, and I'll pass the floor to Laura, who will walk you through the procedure and documentation, the changes that we have done in it in, in, uh, compared to the previous call. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Alcoverrovia. I am the call coordinator uh, for the Innovation Fund. And I will start by guiding you through the uh, very basic and uh, very uh, practical advices on where to find the call and how to start uh, preparing an application. So where to find the call, first of all, you, will, you can find it in this uh, URL. So it's a long one, and there are other ways to uh, go there. The call is published on the funding and tenders portal of the European Commission, like, much, um, like many of other uh, funding programs. So if you uh, look for this portal, funding and tender por uh, opportunities portal, you will reach <clears throat> to this uh, page where you will see a list of all the funding programs that are publishing calls through this means. So the, the Innovation Fund is there, is part of the um, first page. So after clicking, you will uh, get to the funding, uh, to the landing page of the Innovation Fund, where you will see the number of calls that have already uh, been published, and you get to the call that is uh, currently open for submission, the Innovation Fund call for uh, Small Scale Projects 2021. And when you click on the title, you get to the what so-called call page where you will find all the relevant documents and information needed on uh, how to apply and how to prepare your application. So let's start by identifying which are the relevant documents so you will find them under the um, menu conditions and documents. So you can also expand that menu and here you will find uh, different, uh, different documents, different references. The most important one that you have to pay attention to is the call document. Through the call document, you can also get to all the other relevant documents and available help around the call. So once you get yourself familiar with the call document and with the conditions of the call, you can then start the submission of your application. Again, you are on the call page and you have the menu Start Submission. You click on this uh, blue button and you will get inside the submission system. So that should be the first thing that you see when you try to uh, create a proposal and you will see there is a section called Download Part B Templates. When you click here, you will <clears throat> find the necessary templates that you need to use in order to submit that application. These are compulsory. You have to use those templates when uh, required. They concern notably the application form Part B, which is the description of your proposal, and my colleagues will go there afterwards also into the details of their content, the relevant cost calculator and financial information file, the GAG emission avoidance calculator, you have four different types, you have to choose the one that suits your project, the participant information, and the Gantt chart. For these documents, you have to use these templates. I will uh, go uh, a bit further on the details on other parts of the application. And I go back now to this first menu in the submission system, and I would highlight two important buttons, the online manual and the IT how-to. They are always there, they are always there on the forum page, they are always available, and when you click on them, you will find the online manual, on how to prepare 
uh, proposal in the electronic submission system. So it is rather technical, but it will guide you step by step into the different phases. So this is valid also for different funding uh, programs, not only specific to the innovation fund. And for every explanation on every different workflow, you also have this green button, IT How To, where you will find uh, further explanation and demos on how to use the submission uh, system. So once you are in the submission system, which are the important screens that you should be paying special attention to. So we go back to the first screen that you will get at the beginning. And here you have the list of uh, documents that need to be annexed to your application. So part B and annexes, the application form part B, very important, description of your project. And then you, will, you see a series of upload slot, slots. Those in red are compulsory, those in green are not. For those in uh, red, in some cases, you will need to use the templates that I have shown you uh, before. In others, you just need to comply with the uh, required format and extension as described in the call text. Then there is a whole section of, the, um, of your application that need to be filled in directly in the submission system. This, is the so, this will become the so-called Part A. By doing so, you click in this blue button, Edit Forms, and you will get to this first screen, Table of Contents, and here under, uh, generally, uh, I will uh, focus on uh, the uh, points one, three, and four. By point two, it's only about administrative information on the different participants, so it's pretty straightforward how you need to fill in this part. So under general information, what is important here is the fixed keyword one. This is your sector. It is very important that you reflect which is the sector your project belongs to, because this has also an impact on how you will calculate your GAG emission avoidance and how you will be scored under this award criterion. So the sector is of paramount importance that you choose it and that you choose, you choose it according to your project. In section three of this form, you have to indicate with this the requested budget. The requested grant amount, as it has been highlighted, is up to 60% of the relevant cost. It is important that you put in this table, which is uh, this amount, and if there are more than one uh, applicant, how you intend to distribute it between the different uh, members of the consortium. And last but not least, in the screen other questions, we ask you to indicate the location of the project where it will be implemented, and also to indicate the results of your calculations concerning the absolute GAG emission avoidance, the relative GAG emission avoidance, and the cost efficiency. So once you have filled in all the fields in this part A, when you, once you have uploaded all the uh, compulsory documents, you click on submit and you will get a message similar to this one. Your proposal has been submitted. And still you have the possibility to update, to edit, to withdraw your application as long as you do it before the call deadline. Anything that is not submitted before the call deadline, and the call deadline is very, very sharp, at five o'clock in the afternoon sharp, it is no longer possible to submit or modify an application, but before you can. So you can do it through this menu, or you can also do it by getting again into the funding and tenders portal and logging in with your own uh, credentials, you will get to this, uh, to this menu, my proposals, and here you will see the status of your proposal. If it has been submitted or if it is still in draft, and if it has been submitted, you can still perform here the two actions, view submitted or edit draft. 
help is available through uh, the whole process. In, on the call page, you have the menu Get Support, where you will find different links to the different help desks. So the most important ones are the Innovation Fund Help Desk. This is the one that you would use to ask specific questions about the call, about the uh, admissibility, eligibility conditions, about the GAG calculation, about the calculation of relevant costs, about the degree of innovation, etc and on how the proposal is going to be evaluated. You also have the IT help desk on that page for any general inquiries that you uh, may have when using the portal. And as reference, I can also show you that you have much more general support concerning the funding attendance portal and the submission uh, service uh, through uh, the portal itself. And a last piece of information from my side is to make you aware of the admissibility and eligibility criteria. These are described in section five and six of the call text. They are pretty basic, but for every call, we have some proposals which do not meet them. If your proposal does not meet one of the admissibility or eligibility criteria, it will not be further evaluated against the award criteria. So it is important that you consider this criteria before applying and before preparing your application. As it has been mentioned already, you have to submit it be by the call deadline. You have to submit it, to submit your application by using the uh, electronic submission uh, system on the funding and tenders portal. No other means are possible. The application must be complete. So all the application form parts have to be, uh, have to be filled in and encoded in the system, plus all the mandatory annexes uploaded. The applications must also be readable, accessible, and printable. And concerning eligibility, we don't have many minimum requirements, but still, you have to be an eligible applicant, basically a legal entity. It can be uh, that you submit your proposal as single applicant or as part of a consortium, both options are possible. The eligible activities are listed in section two of the call text. The scope is quite broad, but still, your proposal has to be in, scope, in the scope of the call. The actions must be implemented in the EU member states, Norway or Iceland, exclusively, and there is a specific uh, condition for uh, um, pro um, projects implemented in Northern Ireland, and important, your project must be ready to reach financial close within four years after the signature of the grant agreement. And for small scale projects, uh, it must operate at least for three years after the entry into operation. And finally, and this is also specific for small scale projects, the capital expenditure of your projects must be between 2.5 million and 7.5 million. Not less, not more. And after this introduction, I'll hand it over uh, to uh, my uh, colleagues who will go more in detail into the different parts of the uh, application forms and the award criteria. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning everybody. So my name is Gianluca Tondi and I will uh, now with all my colleagues uh, uh, from, from CINEA and uh, from DigiClima will go through the, the work criteria. But uh, before I will, um, I mean, I will uh, complement the presentation just done by Laura with some more information on the, on the application form that you need to, you need to fill in in order to, pay, to, to submit the application. So the application form is constituted basically by three parts, and uh, part A and part C. Uh, part A has been already presented by Laura. This is, must be encoded directly in the system, and they say part C with the key project indicators. On the other hand, part B, this is, uh, you can download, uh, as Laura already shown, the, 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 the word file from the system, 
uh, from the SEP submission system, you, you have to prepare it, uh, let's say, outside the, the, uh, the portal, fill it outside the portal, and then uh, you have to upload it as a PDF file. The limit page, the number of pages, maximum number of pages, 70. So uh, pages more than 70 will be disregarded by experts. And this, is, uh, this uh, part B incorporates all the information related to the work criteria and to, to, to the work packages. Part A has been already presented by Laura, so I will not, uh, I will not go, I mean, I will not present again. The only thing I wanted to, 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 to clarify, to, uh, the message I wanted to pass here is that uh, we noticed in past uh, applications uh, several inconsistencies among information uh, in the different parts uh, of, the, of the proposal. So for instance, it is for the budget, uh, for the duration, uh, for the um, chosen sector, and so on. So please make sure that uh, all the different, uh, the, the, this information are consistent in all the different parts uh, of, um, of the proposal. For instance, for the duration, it's, uh, it's important that uh, this is clear that uh, the duration is the, num the number of years, number of months, uh, when uh, the project benefits of innovation fund support. So it's not simply the duration of the project, for instance, after entry into operation or before uh, or for the construction of the plant. It's, uh, it's the duration of the innovation, plan, uh, innovation fund project, so means the duration uh, uh, established the grant agreement that, that uh, successful proposal will sign with uh, with uh, with Cinea, and so basically is the sum of the of the period before financial close, of the period between financial close and the entry into operation, and uh, uh, finally the uh, three years uh, of uh, operation of the system. So the, again, pay attention to this because we noticed that uh, there are several mistakes in the past uh, applications. Sector choice, Laura already very clearly said why this is very important. So you have to select the sector in part A, fix bo the box fixed keyword one. The different sectors, uh, are you, you can find them in part A because there is a menu, but uh, as shown by Laura, but also please go to the, uh, to the methodology for the greenhouse gas emission calculation. Here you can find all the more detailed information on the different categories, on the different sectors, and you should use this as basis to fill in, in this, this section of the application form. So then we go back to the, to the part B, to the word file, let's call it like that. Uh, there is a, a first section, is section zero, with a, some, let's say, more general information on the, um, on, the, on, the, on the proposal. So for instance, some information, background information, objectives of the project, uh, description of the consortium of the beneficiaries involved, uh, and then also technical characteristics uh, of the project itself. So for instance, project location, the technology that you, you propose to use, uh, um, and some other information on the technological scope, uh, and uh, on more detailed information on the technology solution that you, you you want to use. Then you go to the section 1.5. These are very important, are the maybe the most important sections of the, of the part B. Uh, this is because here you have to describe how your proposal will, uh, will, uh, demo will address all the work criteria that we already presented by Roman uh, previously. So this section should be really, you be concise, but at the same time very self-explanatory and uh, will be very clear for the, the evaluators that will read the, the, the proposal. And also you should clarify uh, references and links to the supporting uh, documents and annexes. So here are the five criteria that have been already presented. Uh, just one uh, mm, clarification from our side uh, that uh, uh, this, the part B is a, is a uh, application form that can be used both for large scale calls and small scale calls. So you will see in the, in the, in the document there are a couple of sections that are not relevant for the, for the are relevant only for the large scale call, so are not relevant now for the small scale call. So you don't need to fill in this part. For instance, just an example, it's uh, the uh, contribution to further your objectives. This is a sub criteria for the large scale call. So here in this part, in this, uh, for the small scale, you don't need to, to fill in this, uh, this part. So pay attention to this just to avoid to spend time on this. 
This, then there is uh, section six. Uh, section six is uh, the part where you have to put um, all the information related to the work plan, uh, to the work packages, uh, and the um, deliverables, milestones, the activities, uh, and so and so on. So this is the really the, the section where you need to, to to explain to present how the project will be will be carried uh, will be carried out. For the work packages description, there is a template. The, a template is uh, embedded in the in the, in the word file in the in the part B. So you, we ask you, of course, to follow the instructions that are, they are mentioned, they are uh, included in the document, in the Word file. So you need to, to, to follow the instruction there. And also for the milestones uh, and for the deliverables also, have to, you have to check the, the application, the, sorry, the call text, uh, section 10, because here also we have some minimum requirements we expect for, this, uh, for, the, for, the, for the work packages, for the deliverables, uh, and for the, for, the, for the milestones. So again, section six, what, what, we, uh, what we mean with the work packages. Uh, so work package means a major subdivision of the project, uh, as already shown I mean, basic in, the, in the previous part of the of the of the of the webinar so you have to define your activities uh, you have to define them in work packages uh, here you can find uh, what we expect as minimum structures of the of the work packages for a small scale projects so um, as recommended structure we we you should have at least one work package up to financial close another one between financial close and entry to operation and then uh, the minimum duration is three years for the operation so three work packages from three to five for instance for the for the phase after the entry in the into operation so this is just indicative uh, content of course then it's up to you i mean depends on the on the project, so you sh the, the number of work packages and the type of work packages should reflect, let's say, the logic of your project. Please don't put too many work packages. Uh, at the same time, we should have a sufficient number of work packages that allow a, I mean, proper monitoring and implementation at the end of the project itself. As already said by, by Roman, payments will be based on lump sums. Uh, so when a work package is completed or more work packages are completed, uh, there is a financial milestone uh, and then uh, the, the, this will trigger the possible payment of, this, uh, of the completed work packages. After entry to operation, this will be based on the, on the achievement of the greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, payment before entry to operation, payment by misproportional to the activities, to the efforts done in that specific work package. And, uh, Periodic reports are necessary to request payment. So at the end of each uh, uh, reporting period, at the end of each work package or group of work packages, uh, you have to submit a periodic report to request the, the payment. After the entry to operation, so during the operation, these periodic reports will be annual, so one payment per year. This is an example of work package setup. It's very similar to the, to the slide already presented by by, by Roman, so I will not go in more detail. So the important thing I wanted to, to, to mention here that uh, uh, there is no pre-financing payment, so this is important to remember, and the payments uh, will be some um, interim payments and then at the end of the project final payments, and uh, for the interim payments, this is, uh, I mean, some here provide some information that uh, reflect what uh, has been already mentioned by Roman this in the morning. Then part B, this has been mentioned by Laura. So there are a number of mandatory documents. Uh, for instance, of course, part B, but also the relevant cost calculator or financial information file, the participant information, the timetable, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions calculator relevant for your project, uh, and then feasibility study, business plan, and the detailed financial model sheets. So these are compulsory documents and this must be submitted in order to consider the proposal uh, complete. Then there are also a number of optional documents, uh, like for instance, support, uh, uh, additional documents supporting, uh, indicating the support of the projects, like electoral support, interest, and so on. Main contracts, uh, off-take uh, off -take agreements, uh, key supply contracts, and so on, and also due diligence reports. So these are optional, but of course, uh, I mean, we strongly recommend you to use also these uh, 
opportunity to, to let's say, to substantiate even more the, the, your proposal. There are certain page limits, 70 pages for Part B, and then 60 pages for the feasibility study and for the business plan. Another important thing is the financial information file that uh, my colleague Christophe will present in more detail. This is mandatory Excel, and uh, you have to be careful that uh, in this Excel file contains four different sections that you have to fill in. So it's uh, clearly mentioned in the, in the file itself. These are the relevant cost calculator where for, the, for the calculation of the capex. Then there is the cost efficiency calculator, and uh, for the, again, for the, for the calculation of the last criteria on the cost efficiency. The financial model summary sheet with all the key data and key information related to the financial model of, the, of your project. And then also a table with the innovation fund grant breakdown per work package and beneficiary. So this is the, the use, let's say the European Union of funds that you, the proposal will receive. So it will be, be, will be, need to be detailed in this table. So this is a compulsory document and you can download the template from the system as Laura has already as Laura has shown before. Then there is another compulsory document, the detailed financial model. There is no uh, detailed format for this, so this is up to you, but we have uh, indicative content that is mentioned uh, in the cold text, but also here in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. So we really encourage you to use, to, to follow these indications. In comparison to the previous calls, there are two new documents, uh, documents that replace partly also of previous documents. So one is the timetable, gun chart. So we ask you to follow the instructions, the, the, let's say the minimum content that is mentioned in this timetable. Uh, or you can use another gun chart, uh, but of course this gun chart should, should, should have at least the minimum content that is mentioned here in this, in the, in this, uh, in this file. And then the other one is the participant information. So this should be filled in by all the beneficiaries of the project. Uh, with relevant information like the participants, the key staff, uh, project, uh, relevant project activities, and so on. So this should be uh, filled in by each of the beneficiaries, and then you should uh, collect all this information together with the CV of the relevant key staff in one or one PDF uh, file. The last one is Part C. Part C is the electronic form that uh, you can find in the, in the, in the, sub, in the submission system. And here you have to fill in a certain number of indicators. Uh, please make sure that these numbers are uh, consistent with other parts of the proposal. If contradiction information part B will take precedence. Uh, unfortunately for the moment, part C is not yet available in the system. If you already try, you will not find this button part C in the, in the, in the, in the sub submission system. We still need to define a certain number of things for this, uh, for this specific form. So this will be available as soon as, as possible. Uh, and of course, information on this will be available on the portal as soon as this form is ready. This is my final slide. So tips, uh, certain number of tips, of course, read all the documents and guidance carefully and uh, mm, submit well in advance in for the de before the deadline. And also, also, as Laura has already mentioned, you can adapt but of course before the deadline. Part B, uh, what, I mean, these are quite uh, clear messages. Uh, again, check consistency among all the documents, uh, respect by page limits, uh, and also please consult FAQ sections in the funding and tender portals. So this was my last slide, and I will pass now the floor to my colleague Uwe for the part on the degree innovation. Thanks a lot. Before we, we start, just one, one uh, a message. Uh, we see many questions coming on the greenhouse gas emissions, just to let you know that we will address all of them in the afternoon session, okay? So that your uh, uh, questions are not lost, they will be answered in the afternoon. And now I pass to Uwe, thank you. Yes, thank you, Roman. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Uwe Lutzen, I'm head of sector in Sinea in the unit for the Innovation Fund, and I would like to uh, give you information about the uh, degree of innovation. So first of all, uh, the degree of innovation should be uh, presented in your application in relation to the state of the art, and uh, this can be the state of the art on European or on national level. 
Here I have a diagram that uh, can uh, be uh, of great help for you when you're preparing your application for the degree of innovation. On the left-hand side, you see three uh, boxes. Um, and uh, if you follow these th three steps, then you will have uh, a good uh, uh, input for your uh, application for the degree of innovation. It starts with uh, number one. Uh, First of all, you need to uh, clearly establish the relevant state of the art uh, in a very clear and in a very comprehensive uh, manner. And this uh, state of the art is uh, uh, not only the technical, technological state of the art, um, but also the commercial state uh, of the art. And uh, clearly describe them, uh, both of them, if possible and uh, underline them with uh, in, uh, relevant information on, uh, on cost, on production uh, uh, characteristics, uh, um, on performance data if available um, as your starting point. Then in the second step, you will explain why your innovation, why your project goes beyond incremental innovation and you are here uh, again comparing this to the state uh, of the art. For this is useful if you are identifying barriers, uh, uh, for example, barriers for, for scaling up uh, of your technologies, uh, barriers uh, for combining these uh, technologies that uh, you uh, are addressing uh, with your innovation. And then finally you get uh, to a, a third step uh, once you have uh, established the state of the art, once you have clearly uh, explained why you are going beyond the state of the art with your innovation, then uh, you uh, have to underline these uh, uh, with clear key performance data. So uh, you put evidence on what you have described before. Um, and this can be done in uh, different uh, documents, for example, in the feasibility study or in any other documents uh, that uh, my colleagues already have uh, mentioned. Um, uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, in the greenhouse gas calculation uh, Excel sheet, there is a, a tab uh, where you can also have uh, input. Um, and uh, again, in these key performance data, uh, uh, you are now describing your situation with your te technology in relation to uh, cost uh, uh, production characteristics. Uh, the, the level of your technology, TRL, the system readiness level, etc., and compare it uh, to the uh, state uh, of the art. So, um, some tips here. Um, uh, check clearly the Annex 1 of the call text. There you will find examples. There you will find uh, further explanations for the state of, uh, for the degree of innovation. And uh, as I said, uh, compared the, uh, the proposed innovations for your project with both the commercial and the technological state of the art and uh, with all your information, all the uh, information you're giving, uh, be uh, very transparent, uh, be very uh, concise and uh, give as much uh, information as possible. Okay. Thank you. And with this, uh, I'm handing over to uh, Johanna. Thank you very much, Uwe. Hello, everyone. Um, so I will quickly walk you through a few slides on our second award criterion, the greenhouse gas emission avoidance. Um, as Uwe already said, we will have a longer session this afternoon that will explain all of this in much more detail, and you'll be able to, to ask all your questions. Um, so, of course, you know that under the Innovation Fund, we are looking to fund projects that lead to substantial greenhouse gas avoidance. And for that reason, we need to look at each project at each project and how they are likely to reduce emissions. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Yes, here we go. Okay, so um, in evaluating emission avoidance, uh, we look at three criteria. The absolute emission avoidance, the relative emission avoidance, and then we've got a new third sub-criterion, which includes three aspects, which is the quality and credibility of the GHG calculations, the potential to deliver net carbon removal, so to have negative project emissions, 
And then other GHG savings that are not associated with uh, the main product, but other GHG savings in the project. Um, and these have been added, so this is a change that has happened since the last call. Uh, we know that these calculations can seem daunting, um, and it's really, but it's really important to do them carefully, to explain them well, and to be transparent with your assumptions. Uh, you don't want to leave the evaluators wondering uh, what numbers are, where they come from. So I'll be going into that in a bit more detail when we look at the calculation tool. Could I have the next slide? Thanks. Okay, so the main the main calculation is the calculation of absolute GHG emission avoidance of the project and relative GHG emissions avoidance of the project. The absolute GHG emission avoidance is the total avoidance of emissions of the projects relative to a reference case. And this is the only criterion where projects will be evaluated not against all other projects, but only against projects in the sector that the project has applied in. So this is to make sure that the size of the project um, is in line with other projects in that sector and projects are not uh, penalized for smaller absolute size. Then the relative GHG emissions looks at how much um, in relative terms compared to the reference case does your project reduce emissions and that's indicated in percent. All GHG calculations will be done over a time scale of 10 years and for the reference scenario we provide um, reference emission factors that are indicated in the GHG calculation tool and that you have to use so that, that there's comparability uh, between all of the calculations. And I would have the next slide, please. Great. So this time, a, a new um, calculation that we look at is that of net carbon removals. Net carbon removals can be claimed by projects that deliver negative total carbon emissions. Um, and there are a lot of natural and technological solutions out there that can deliver such negative emissions. But here, under the small scale call, we are, of course, looking for projects that fall into the eligible sectors under the application. So in general, um, in the, these will be projects that combine um, or likely will be projects that combine um, carbon capture from the air or uh, from biogenic sources with either permanent geological storage or with storage of carbon um, in a very long-lived material or product. So if for your project that is the case, you will be rewarded for um, making that extra net carbon removals calculation. Could I have the next slide? Thanks. Uh, really important to note, there are two minimum requirements uh, to the GHG calculation. Um, the first one is your calculation has to make a comparison with an EU ETS benchmark case where the project produces something that has an EU ETS benchmark. Um, and here the project emissions for the product that you choose need to be lower than the corresponding emissions in the ETS benchmark. And secondly, if your project uses biomass as a feedstock, you need to make sure that uh, the biomass is from sustainable resources as defined um, in the Renewable Energy Directive. Next slide. Great. So this is for those of you who might be um, who might be reapplying and who have already applied last time. So there were some changes that we made to improve the clarity of the GHG calculations. Um, I won't go into detail on all of them, but um, maybe picking out the most important ones. Um, in general, we have we have defined the conditions for hybrid projects more clearly. Um, in the energy intensive industry, we have added a requirement to add emissions of transport of biomass if biomass is transported for over 500 kilometers. So that needs to be accounted for now. Um, then we have added rules um, to make it possible that you can get credit for carbon stored in long lived products. So these are um, this is carbon storage over 50 years, so this can now also be in non-geological storage. Um, 
And yeah, I think for any of these changes, you can refer to the slides or this afternoon, um, we can go into more detail on that as well. Can I have the next slide? Thanks. Okay, so lastly, to point out something that's really important, uh, and that should be a proper resource to you in doing your application. Um, so there are calculation tools for the greenhouse gas emission avoidance that we provide both on our website and then in the tender portal. They are obligatory to use and they are there to make your life and our life easier and they should really be a resource to you. As you see, not all tabs are mandatory to fill out, but the mandatory ones that you have to fill in are the summary, the reference emissions, the project emissions, and the process diagram for your project. And then we think it's really highly advisable to fill in the assumptions tab and to be really transparent and clear with the assumptions on figures um, that you use in your calculation. This really helps the evaluators to follow your calculation and makes your calculation much more transparent in general. So that said, there will be much more detail in the afternoon and also the possibility to ask questions. So for now, I will pass it back to Gianluca and um, he can go on with the next evaluation criterion. Thanks. So thanks, Joanna. And uh, so I will go now, we'll present uh, with uh, my colleague of the financial engineering team, Christophe, we'll present the criterion of project maturity. So here, this criterion, you have to demonstrate that your project is uh, sufficiently mature to, to, to achieve the uh, expected greenhouse gas emission savings, to, to, to reach financial closing within four years, and also to be ready, let's say, for a su successful implementation of, uh, of the project. So I will present now technical and operational maturity, and then Christophe will present the financial part. So the technical maturity, here the objective, and uh, you, you, again, what you have to demonstrate that this project is uh, technically mature for the, I mean, to, to at the end to achieve uh, what uh, the expected output in terms of greenhouse gas uh, emissions avoidance. Then also you need to, to, to clearly uh, identify and uh, the, the possible technological risks and also the, the, the mitigation measure that you, you, you think can be useful to, to mitigate this, uh, these risks. Uh, so the most relevant parts uh, in the proposal related uh, to this criterion are the, in the application form in part B, it's section 3.1 on technical maturity and then 3.4 on the risk management. And uh, we can also, experts will also have a look to section zero where there are technical characteristics and scope of the proposed technology. Uh, there is another important document, is the feasibility study that I remember, uh, remind you is mandatory. And then also optional, but uh, okay, okay, re recommended also any ex existing technical due diligence uh, uh, report if, uh, if available. Always please make references to these documents in the, in the application form. So the first one is the technical feasibility of, of your project to deliver the expected outputs uh, and uh, at the end, uh, the greenhouse gas uh, emissions avoidance that uh, you, 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 you expect. And so here, um, you should follow the guidance provided in the application form, section 3.1, as I said before. You, you should uh, explain and present the degree of the technology readiness of the proposed solution. And uh, at, at the end, the, 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 the technical feasibility of your project to, to deliver the expected outputs, for instance, in terms of volumes of certain product, but ultimately to achieve the expected greenhouse gas emissions avoidance in the, in the operational environment of your project. In particular, you need to reply to a certain number of questions. These are clearly mentioned in the, in the application form. For instance, whether proposed technology has, has been already proven in previous uh, TRL levels uh, or in pilot scale, demo, pilot scale demonstration, for instance. Uh, if the characteristics of the proposed plant uh, are credible, uh, are they in line with basic engineering principles? Uh, and uh, you should clearly present the assumptions uh, that you used to, 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 yes, to somehow to simulate the operational characteristics of the plant. Uh, for instance, this, these assumptions should be clearly presented, they should be clearly explained, uh, and selected in a, in a conservative manner, still accurate manner. 
And uh, this is, of course, to avoid that uh, at the end the, the, the calculation of the greenhouse gas uh, emissions avoided uh, is uh, it's overestimated or underestimated. And uh, as I said before, please make uh, clear reference to relevant parts of the, of the feasibility study or other supporting documents. For the risks, uh, as I said before, uh, this is another important part of the technical maturity subcriterion. Uh, there is a specific section on this, 3.4. This is different in comparison to previous goals, so we will find now only one main section with all the risks, technical, financial, and operational. So you need to fill in this pay for this one, for the technical maturity, of course, there is the part on technical risks. You have to describe here the key technological risks uh, that you, you identified in relation to your technology. Um, then uh, you have to describe the mitigation measure that you propose in order to, again, to mitigate this risk. You have to, they should, uh, you should convince the expert that these are uh, mitigation measures are appropriate and suitable to, 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 yes, to mitigate the risk itself. And uh, then uh, you should summarize all these risks uh, in the, there is a specific table, the risk table in section 3.4, again, of the application form. And here you should summarize somehow the outcomes of the previous uh, sections. And again, always underpin your analysis with the feasibility study and especially with the risk heat map that is mentioned in the, in the call text. So for the feasibility study, this is a mandatory annex. We don't have a template that uh, we don't ask you to, f to, f to follow a specific, uh, we don't have a template that you can find in the, in the, in the submission system. However, you should, uh, uh, your feasibility study should cover at least the points that are mentioned uh, in the cool text, uh, and you can find uh, there or here in these slides uh, all the, 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 say, the minimum requirements that we expect in this, uh, in this uh, document. Then I pass now to the operational maturity. Uh, so here for the operational maturity, basically you have to demonstrate that your project is ready for a successful deployment of the, of the, proposed, uh, of the proposed technology, of the proposed plant. Um, there are five criteria that uh, you need to address uh, in this section, and uh, these are project implementation plan, so the planning of your project. Uh, uh, the section permits, rights, uh, IPR, and so on, uh, public acceptance, uh, project management team and uh, project organization, and finally, again, on, uh, on risks and uh, mitigation measures. Um, the relevant sections in the, in the application form are 3.3 and 3.4 for the risks. Uh, there is also, uh, under 3.3, you, you will see that you need to, fa to fill in a project diagram where you present the organization of the project. And then this is section six uh, with the work plan uh, and the work packages, activities, resources, and timings. And the timetable, in particular, the file that uh, we already presented in the previous uh, presentation. And finally, also, if available, an existing due diligence uh, report. So for the first uh, aspect uh, of this, uh, of the operational maturity, uh, this is uh, li related to the to the implementation planning of the project, included the milestones, uh, deliverables, timing, uh, uh, all these related to all the different phases of the project. So before financial close, between financial close and entry into operation, and also after entry into operation. So project milestones uh, should include at least a financial close, of course, uh, that Christophe will present in more detail, uh, entry into operation, and also annual uh, reporting after entry into operation. Again, the guidance is provided in the cool text in the application form. Uh, you should provide uh, and present clearly the timeline from signature of the grant to the, to the end of the operation period, and again, ensure consistency among all the different uh, documents. Um, key aspects you have to consider in this, uh, this aspect is uh, the strategy. You have to present a clear strategy on how you plan to reach all the milestones, uh, include the financial close and the entry into operation, and ensure in the timing, appropriate timing of the, all the planned activities uh, for the whole project, from, from the start to the end of the project itself, the innovation fund project. And then the implementation planning should be consists, of course, with the work packages, uh, the milestones, uh, and the deliverables that you describe in section six uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the application form. The second point on the under operational maturity, 
um, is on the state of play and the credibility of the plant to, to obtain uh, required permits, IPR, license, or other, other regulatory um, aspect that you have to, you have to tre cope with uh, during the project. Um, so here, the key aspects to be covered in this section are you need to present, uh, you need to provide a detailed analysis of the regulatory framework, uh, any IPR uh, rights or license, uh, other relevant regulatory procedures, uh, and uh, in particular, relevant permitting processes, uh, including permits related to the environmental impact. So we expect a clear description of uh, all the these, uh, all these aspects, at the same time, a state of play. So, what is the current situation related to this? Uh, for instance, to the permits, are they being already achieved? If not, also to propose to present the timing, uh, the strategy you 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 have in mind to to obtain them in time, of course. And um, yeah, this is for the second point. For the third one. Uh, that one is related to the public acceptance of your project. So here, the first thing you have to do is describe all the environmental impacts that you expect throughout the project, uh, from the start of the project to the decommissioning of the project itself, uh, and also the, uh, the, 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 the associated mitigation measures. Um, so you should also clearly present that uh, the, the degree of public acceptance of the technology and of the project. Uh, and the finally, and also how you the plan, the strategy on how you, do, you, you plan to ensure that this public acceptance is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is ensured during the project itself. And please don't uh, put uh, generic explanations on this issue, but try to be concrete and focused on the specific issues of your project. Then, uh, Again, uh, uh, for the operational maturity, another point is related to the project management team and the project organization. So the project management team, you need to present uh, key qualifications and track record that you need uh, to implement the project itself. Uh, you need to prove that there is sufficient coverage of uh, all the necessary skills and eventually provide justifications uh, uh, on the need, uh, if you need additional outside resources, why you need them. And uh, for the project organization, uh, provide information, project management structure, governance, uh, uh, responsibilities, decision-making structure, mechanism, and so, and so on. And also, as you will see in the section 3.3, also you have to present, uh, uh, provide a project diagram uh, with, uh, with, with a visualization of all the involved actors uh, and stakeholders in the, in the project itself. Finally, there is uh, the part on the on risks is similar to, I mean, is uh, mirroring the, 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 the what I've already said on the technical risks. So you need to describe clearly which are the key problems with implementation risks. So for instance, related to construction, project design, operation, and decommissioning. And then uh, propose convincing risk mitigation measures to address the, the, the identified uh, risks. And again, uh, this risk should be summarized in the, the, the table uh, in the table on the section 3.4 of the application form. And this was my last slide, so I hand over now to Christophe the financial part. Thank you, John Luca. My name is Christophe de Hoot. I'm a senior financial engineer in the team of uh, the financial engineers of CINEA. I will now give you a few words on the, the financial maturity um, then move to cost efficiency and give you also a few words on the project development assistance which was presented this morning. As uh, Ro Roman said, I mean, the financial maturity is quite, I would say, as all the others, important sub-criteria as we saw many files actually failing on this sub-criteria in the first call last year. So. My advice is that you really pay attention to fill in correctly and coherently all the documents which will be part of your application. As Stefan said this morning also, we want to select projects which will be implemented in order to contribute to the greenhouse gas reduction. And therefore there's a lot of, I would say, insistence and uh, focus on the project's capacity to reach financial close within four years. 
Um, therefore, I mean, the, the four main points you need to fill in for the financial maturity are the project business plan, the project um, financing plan also, and the profitability. What's the soundness of the financing plan I mean, for your project to finance your capital expenditures? What is the commitment of the project funders? And last but not least, what is your understanding of the project financial risk and also business risks? The relevant parts of the application form part B, which were presented by um, John Luca earlier, uh, which need, will need to be filled are the part 3.2 on financial maturity, but also 3.4 for the risks. Um, also really feel carefully the section six, which deal with the work packages, activity, and milestones. Um, as was presented also earlier, there are some man mandatory annexes, uh, like before, like the business plan, which should normally include the financial statements of the different project shareholders, if there are several. Um, this is new for this call, and it was presented, the financial information file. May I still insist on the need to fill in all the sheets in this file so that the experts can really look at all the information in a coherent way. Um, and also your financial model, as was described by John luca earlier. If there is any form of due diligence report you have, you can, of course, include it in your application, but this part is optional. First point on the business model and the business plan, please describe, I mean, thoroughly your project business model. Um, we and the, the evaluators really care for quality and not quantity. So a business model can be described in a few sentences. Uh, it must be clear, but real. Please also pay attention to the scope uh, of your business model and the business plan. It should really cover the project you apply for and the project we will finance. It does not and should not include your future developments or the overall business plan of the company as such. So please pay attention to that. It's quite important that you describe coherently and completely the different assumptions around the main revenues and cost assumptions. Uh, this should be really detailed in the business plan. In the application form part B, you need to include a summary of these, but the experts need to be able to find more details if they need to in the business plan. So application form part B is a summary of the business plan. You don't need to copy again your business plan there. Uh, again, please make sure that all the information is coherent across the different documents of your application. Um, another point, which I think is new here, is to describe the strategy to secure the key contracts with off-takers. Of course, it will depend on how mature and where you are in the development of, of your project. But if you can, please include also letters of support and indicate in terms of any form of memorandum of understanding you may have. Last point on this slide is please justify. We, we know contingencies are part of projects, but please justify them, their level and make sure that they are in line with the innovation we want, you want us to finance, but with also the market practice in your sector. The next point deals with, I mean, how do you translate this business model, this business plan into the financial model? As we said earlier, and I won't spend too much time on that, it's important that you fill in completely the financial model summary sheet that you also add your own financial model and that you ensure the coherency of all the figures in the financial model summary sheet, but also in the relevant cost calculation template. Uh, please also describe the project returns over the entire project lifetime. Uh, some projects failed earlier because they just give information over only the monitoring period. Um, the financial model and the project return should really cover the whole operational lifetime of the project we are going to finance.
please also describe correctly and completely all the assumptions used for the computation of the weighted average cost of capital, uh, which should reflect normally the project risks. Um, next point deals with the financing plan. As we said, we want to make sure that the project we select will reach financial close in the next four years. So we will, the, the evaluators will really look at uh, what's the way to reach this financial close. Um, they will look at the way you intend to finance your project and also look at closely if you intend to raise external debt for it. How is it justified with the level of stability of the cash flows in your business plan and in your business model? Uh, please also make sure that when you look at the financing plan and the use of the grant, that the grant disbursement is really in line with the core text. There are some specific rules that you need to comply with. <coughs> Next point which is quite important is the commitment of the project funders. Um, please provide us with any form of letter of interest support, letters of approvals from the different shareholders or the board confirming the support of the financing plan. If you also intend to use some other uh, mechanism of support from potentially member states, please also specify which ones and where you are in trying to get this additional funding. Last point deals with business and financial risks. So in the relevant section, please describe the completely the different risks identified and the appropriate mitigation measures. Uh, also, if there, are, there is need of additional fund off if you make some specific assumptions please describe exactly what would be the potential backup plan in terms of financing for the project if these different assumptions do not materialize now word on cost efficiency uh, which is another i mean criteria of uh, selection uh, so cost efficiency is the division the ratio between the re requested innovation fund grant with the total absolute greenhouse gas emission avoidance over 10 years. Um, of course, if you request less than 60% of the total relevant costs, you may have a lower cost efficiency ratio. However, and this is a change compared to the previous calls, if you intend to request additional specific state aid, uh, which would actually allow you to reduce the innovation fund grant you would request, these additional specific state aid must be taken into account in the computation of this ratio on the main numerator side. Um, there is ample information on that in the call text, so please follow closely these guidelines and these rules. On the relevant costs themselves, um, as you may know, the small scale uh, coal is simpler than the large scale coal. Uh, therefore, the relevant costs are nearly, I would say, equivalent to the capital expenditure of the project. Um, the capital expenditure include the construction costs, the site infrastructure development cost, and some intangible assets. However, you will see here on this slide, there are few costs which are excluded. Uh, for example, the, the financing costs linked to a potential external financing. As Laura said also, please keep in mind that are only eligible projects with a minimum of 2.5 million and a maximum of 7.5 million of capital expenditures. And if your project is selected, the capital expenditures and the relevant cost will need to be certified by an independent auditor during the grant agreement uh, preparation. So it's also, I insist on that, compulsory for you to fill in the relevant sheet with the relevant cost calculation in the financial information file. To conclude on the project development assistance, so we, we, we may select them in several files which have not been selected. 
but these files uh, need to fill in some conditions which are described in the call text. Particularly, they must reach the minimum thresholds for the degree of inhibition and greenhouse gas emission criteria. They must be awarded at least 50% of each project maturity subcriteria and must be considered by the experts as having the potential to improve their maturity using this project development assistance offered by the EIB. Um, the PDA supports actually consist of expert services provided by the European Investment Bank. Um, they will be managed under a project-specific contract um, with the EIB, and the EIB has the capacity to select up to 20 proje projects, uh, which will be submitted by CINEA to the EIB after the selection of the projects for this call. This was all for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susanna Galloni. I am head of sector in uh, CINEA Innovation Fund Unit. The last award criteria is scalability. Its objective is to assess the impact of the project beyond the project boundaries. And it includes four different areas the scalability at the project site and the regional economy impact, the scalability at the level of the sector, the impact of the project economy-wide, and the quality and extent of the knowledge sharing. First of all, always remember when highlighting the impact of the project to consider both short, medium terms and also long-term impacts. When looking at the project level, you need to highlight further expansion opportunities at the project site and at other sites. When highlighting the, the impact of the project on the regional economy, you need to stress the cooperation opportunities with other relevant, relevant actors in the regional economy and the impacts of the project on, in terms of growth and jobs creation, again, at the regional level. It is also important to highlight the scalability um, opportunities at the level of the sector, in particular the extent to which the technology can be applied within the sector, and this has to be substantiated by doing filling in uh, the tab called scalability in the GAG calculator Excel sheet. So your claims need to be substantiated there. You also need to refer to the expected cost reductions that um, the technology, when applied at the level of the sector, is expected to, to bring. And also, if there is any resource constraints, and this, in this case, how any constraint can be overcome in the future. When highlighting the economy-wide scalability, you should stress the extent to which the economy, uh, the technology of the project can be applied across the economy, and here again, you need to substantiate your claims uh, via the scalability tab in the GAG calculator Excel sheet. You need to make reference and substantiate on the potential to create new value chains, or if that's the case, reinforce existing ones in Europe and um, the contribution to the development of strategic autonomy in industrial supply chains, if that is applicable. The fourth area of scalability is the quality and extent of knowledge sharing. You need to refer to the Annex 2 of the code text is precisely called knowledge sharing. And uh, in the Annex 2, it is further detailed what is expected. The knowledge sharing objectives are basically to the risk the innovative low carbon technologies that are funded by the Innovation Fund with regard to wide scale commercialization, to accelerate the deployment of the technologies, and to increase the undertaking and the confidence of these technologies by the wider public. And the uh, final uh, wider objective is to man maintain a competitive market for the post-demonstration deployment of the technologies that the project will uh, demonstrate. The knowledge sharing activities are divided um, between the ones performed by the beneficiaries and the ones that CINEA will perform. On your end, uh, you will have knowledge sharing reporting obligations. 
you are expected to have a proactive and systematic communication and dissemination um, attitude. So to have uh, very clear activities at the value project stage to um, communicate and disseminate the project. And on CINEA end, uh, we will inform, communicate, and also perform promotion activities. We will organize specific seminars, workshops, and uh, events. Uh, to make sure that uh, the projects and the wider uh, community benefits from um, knowledge sharing. So in practice, um, knowledge sharing is an obligation of the grant. Um, however, there is no obligation to disclose if there is any risk of reverse engineering. It is, of course, in everyone's uh, interest to uh, protect any IPR that the project uh, will uh, will uh, generate knowledge sharing will start after grant signature, and uh, it is well detailed in uh, in the call text when it is uh, the project is supposed to report on uh, knowledge sharing from financial close to entry into operation uh, up to the end of the operation period. There will be soon a knowledge sharing template um, report available in uh, the funding and tender portal. However, this is not available yet, but please uh, check um, periodically the funding and tender portal and uh, it will be published um, in the near future. And for the knowledge of second time, on saving time, uh, I think that this is the end of my presentation and over to Raman for the Q&A session. Thank you, Susanna, and uh, thank you all for, for the presentations and uh, explanations. I hope uh, this gave you um, a, a deeper understanding of the uh, requirements uh, under the different um, uh, criteria uh, under this small scale call, and uh, also explanations on how to apply, what to do, uh, where to look, and so on. Uh, just one generic message, uh, please take into account that you will find all the call documents on the funding and tenders portal. Uh, and uh, again, if you Google it, you will find it and everything is out there. So let's take a couple of questions before the, before the lunch break. So the first one, uh, what is the standard setup that a special purpose vehicle must have in order to be eligible? What is the internal best structure an SPV should have in order to coordinate the project, for example, in terms of stuff. I think this would be a deal for Crystal. <laughs> no, you don't need this. Thank you, Roman. <laughs> Actually, um, it's, it's up to you, really. Um, it needs to be a legal entity, specially created to host the, the, I mean, the, the assets which will actually run the project. Um, usually an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, is uh, created by several shareholders to isolate and ring fence the activities and the cash flows of this project and most probably the, the external debt which might be raised. So these are the main characteristics, I mean, special legal entity outside of, I would say, the consolidation sometimes of, um, of your balance sheet with, um, well, the staff might be a question on do you dedicate staff there or is there any form of service agreement between the SPV and uh, the mother company or another entity offering um, operational service? I think this can be envisaged and we've seen that in uh, several cases already. Okay, next question. Can research centers participate as partners in a project as technology providers? The integration of the technology will be done by engineering companies. I can pass this to Laura, yes? Yes, thank you, Roman. Uh, any uh, applicant can apply as long as it fulfills the uh, eligibility uh, conditions. It must be a legal entity. The activities of this applicant uh, have to be within the, uh, the scope 
uh, of what the innovation fund covers. So it is perfectly possible to have an engineering company and a research center, for instance, uh, participating uh, together as a consortium and submitting a proposal to the innovation fund. In all cases, if, um, if you submit a proposal with a consortium, all the partners in the consortium must have a role uh, in delivering the project. This is uh, also that, uh, something that will be considered for the evaluation. Okay, thank you. The next question, is there any funding rate for research centers or they also receive a lump sum? Uh, yes, the answer is very clear. They receive a lump sum. The whole project receives a lump sum payment. We don't have any distinction between the types of beneficiaries uh, involved in the consortia. Uh, we have a simple uh, a structure in the Innovation Fund small scale, which is we finance up to 60% of the capital expenditure of the project as a whole. Next question, when filling in application form technical description part B, is only text allowed or can images be also inserted? Um, I think I pass this to Gianluca. It's only text. No, you can, uh, I mean, if you have mm, graphs or charts or images, uh, uh, you can insert in the in the part B, as I said before, is a word file, so you can, uh, I mean, you can include also if uh, images, as you said, illustrations can be inserted as well. And of course, at the end, you need to be sure that this is when you convert into PDF, this is done uh, in a, in the correct way. Thank you. What what does the geographical reference point to define state of the art now the country where the project is located mean exactly? Yeah, I think you, the question refers to what does the country uh, uh, point means? And uh, I think, Uwe, you can, you can take this. Yes, uh, thank you, Roman. So um, the, the geographical reference point to define state of the art is clearly uh, as you have it already in the in the question, is the country where the project is located. So you have to uh, look uh, for the state of the art uh, in the country where the project will take place and compare it uh, to that state of the of the art. Thank you. Regarding degree of innovation, will it have effects on points whether the project is innovative on European level or national level? Well, I think this is similar. similar. Yes. Um, so first of all, for the for the scoring for the points, uh, it's important uh, uh, is the level of the innovation and uh, how clearly it's substantiated uh, 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 in your uh, application. So it's very important that you clearly explain uh, and. Uh, uh, not only clearly, but also convincingly explain and uh, put uh, sufficient evidence uh, for your uh, level of innovation compared to the state of the art. That is uh, what definitely uh, is important for the scoring. Um, and not if it's uh, uh, re relevant on the European or national level. And uh, maybe as a background, uh, so uh, this uh, national level is uh, designed uh, to help more projects uh, to be supported in countries with lower number of award projects so far. So that the project simply will not be penalized for being innovative uh, on national level uh, uh, only. Okay, the next question. If grant payments after completion of the project during the operation period are based on achieved greenhouse gas emission savings, what is included in an operating period work package? I believe this relates to the activities and costs. So maybe, Christoph, you can, you can answer this one. Well, typically what we see, and John Luca, correct me if I'm wrong, in the work packages in the operating periods are, of course, the um, report on greenhouse gas savings, also the knowledge sharing reports, um, and any other report which has been agreed between the, the applicant and uh, the agency. Yeah, yes, exactly. So we, we expect, of course, I mean, we don't expect many things in this work package because it's, it's, it's quite clear, but we expect uh, some description of the activities related to the 
operation of the plant, as uh, Christophe said, then all the other tasks related to the monitoring and the uh, reporting of the greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, or savings. So the, and, uh, and you can also, again, as I said before, in the cold text and the application form, you can also find uh, which are the minimum requirements in terms of reporting on deliverables, so knowledge sharing, and the greenhouse gas. Yes, if you have, for instance, ramp up period, uh, even in the small scale coal, this element should be obviously uh, reported in those work packages. What are the experiences with getting the technology up and running? Uh, what are the issues? There may be other elements uh, connected to operating. So this is really up to you how you design this, uh, a part of those things that were mentioned. And also related question, uh, how, uh, please elaborate the proportionality of the grant payments. How should it be evidenced? And uh, yeah, Christoph. Yes, thanks, Roman. Just before I answer that, another point on the SPV. Of course, this SPV must fill in all the eligibility criteria which are described in the in the call text. Now, to answer this point on proportionality, Article 10 of the call text actually talks about that and um, says that the, the lump sum which will be defined by the applicant and checked by the evaluators and also discussed during the grant agreement preparation, these lump sum, I would say, cover activities which are described in the, in the work packages. Uh, we say that uh, these lump sum must be proportional to the activities and to some extent also to the expenditure which are linked to these work packages. Uh, how should it be evidenced? The experts will look at, as I said, to the activities which are described in these uh, work packages, but they will also make the link and look at what's in the financial model uh, in terms of, I would say, level of spending during the period which are covered by the, by the work packages themselves. Okay, if a project to capture and valorize CO2 expect profits, can it obtain a grant? I understand income gets deduced, so eligible costs would be negative. Um, the, there is a simple answer. Yes, you can. Uh, uh, we, um, uh, unlike maybe any other programs, we actually do expect you to uh, uh, to, to uh, achieve profits. Otherwise, the project wouldn't be implemented on the market. Uh, it is a simple structure that uh, that we use in small scale coal. We just finance up to 60% of your capital expenditure. So we don't uh, reflect upon your um, uh, revenues or operating costs. This is for the large scale projects. In the small scale coal, it's very simple. And yes, you should apply, uh, even if you are getting profit, uh, if you have relevant costs, meaning that if you need funding from us in order to financially close in four years. Can the Innovation Fund, fund uh, funding be combined with national funding? We would obviously ensure that there is no double funding of activities. The answer is yes, it can. And uh, uh, subject to uh, rules on the state aid funding, which obviously do apply. Are project costs eligible after submitting the project proposal or signing the grant agreement? If a project is ongoing, will the already incurred cost be eligible? So again, very simple answer here. Uh, in the small scale call, we cover up to 60% of your capital expenditure. That mm -hmm. must be incurred as of submission of your application. Okay, so yes, it can be retrospective, but the, the, the initial date is the date of your submission uh, in, in, the, uh, in the call. I hope this is, this is clear. Christophe, anything to add? No, no, it's described in the call text in Article 10 again. I think uh, we, we can close uh, the morning session. We are 12 minutes after the, the timing, um, uh, but I hope this was very useful uh, for, for you uh, with a lot of information, a lot to digest. Uh, please don't hesitate to uh, review the, the session later. We'll record it, it will be placed on the website and uh, you will have access to it. Uh, also, uh, please, uh, again, don't forget to uh, fill in our survey which we will be used to improve the quality of these sessions going forward. Um, uh, yes, the, the answers are available in Slido. I said this all in the morning. And uh, also what is important in the, in the lower box, please do check the documents that we have prepared for you.
for the small scale projects, whether this is the, the, the previous lessons learned, uh, whether this is the, the, the self-check questionnaire, uh, whether this is statistics, there is a lot of material out there for you. Uh, all the information related to the call is on the funding and tender portal, so please go, go there, have a good look, and please use our help desk, which is open for the applicants, where you can put all your uh, project-specific questions. And in the afternoon, uh, we will have uh, another focused, dedicated half-day uh, addressing the greenhouse gas emissions calculation methodology. So we will have Maria Velkova here from DG Klima, who will uh, be uh, moderating the session uh, together with people and colleagues from DG Klima and the JRC. So please come back and uh, join us in the afternoon uh, in the respective part related to uh, your particular uh, area of interest. Marta is, sorry. Uh, and yes, we are starting at 2 p.m., uh, very important. Uh, we don't have the slide now to show the timing, but we will start the afternoon session at 2 p.m., and I'm looking very much forward to meet you again. In the meantime, bon appétit.
Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back. Very, very happy to continue our info day on the second um, uh, small, scale call, pro small scale projects call under the Innovation Fund. In the morning, uh, uh, we have been following the presentation about the call, about the different award criteria. Now in the afternoon, uh, we have a full session, which is actually divided in the number of uh, shorter mini sessions. Uh, around uh, the criterion greenhouse gas emissions avoidance, as this criterion is quite complex, requires um, uh, to follow the methodology, and therefore we, uh, we, uh, we, we set specifically the time for this so that we have enough explanation and we have a good discussion also going on through Slido. Uh, in the afternoon, I'm very happy uh, that Maria Velkova from DigiClima has joined us today. She will be moderating the, the sessions. Uh, uh, and also we will have colleagues joining remotely from the Joint Research Center, uh, Ekaterini, uh, Rothio, and Michele, who will provide you through, uh, will provide you the different explanations on the methodologies. And we will in fact have one presentation on the methodology uh, in general, and then four mini sessions of 45 minutes addressing the energy intensive industry, uh, carbon capture and storage, renewables, and energy storage methodologies to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, as in the morning, um, um, everything happens on Slido, so please put your questions, your comments there, we will try to answer, and uh, the most relevant questions will be picked up and answered live. Uh, the rest will be addressed uh, during our discussions, and also, again, just to repeat, if you have project-specific complex questions, please uh, um, uh, upload them through our help desk, which has been opened on the funding and tenders portal. And with this, I think uh, I'll pass to Maria, who can introduce the next speaker, and uh, enjoy the afternoon. Thank you, Roman. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, we're very pleased, actually, to have with us uh, the whole team uh, from JRC, uh, who will walk you through the greenhouse gas emission methodologies, as just announced by, by Roman. Uh, we will follow, actually, the agenda as announced uh, on uh, the event web page. So uh, if you're interested only in CCS or energy storage projects, you can just uh, switch off uh, and on again. And uh, we will uh, be recording the session so you can actually watch it also later on. So I will uh, pass now the, the floor to Michele Canova from JRC, who will walk you through the main principles and of the methodology. Two minutes. Can you hear me well? Good, good afternoon. Yes, we can hear you well. Good, thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, I will go through uh, a bit the general concept uh, on uh, submitting, uh, preparing and submitting an application for the small scale call uh, of the Innovation Fund. So uh, on the screen in this moment, you see a summary of uh, six uh, main steps that you have to go through. Uh, when you prepare your uh, your presentation, your application. So uh, in the in these six steps, uh, uh, first of all, you have to define project and organizational boundaries. You have to classify your project uh, uh, according to the classification that is given in the uh, methodology. You have to identify the appropriate methodology section to perform your calculation. Uh, you have to find uh, your uh, specific tools that we, we develop and uh, offer to applicants. Uh, you have to then also identify the reference scenario for your project type and sector, apply uh, your projected operational data to, to the calculations, and then finally uh, upload the estimated greenhouse gas emission avoidance to, uh, to the submission portal. Uh, together with all the documents and, uh, and uh, proofs, let's say, uh, supporting uh, document that uh, is needed throughout your application. Of course, this is uh, something that uh, entails an overall consistency of your application. 
What, what do I mean when I say that? I mean that uh, in practice, uh, applicants may, well, may finalize the decision of, even on the first step on boundaries only when everything else is also being uh, consistently uh, thought and uh, uh, developed. Sometimes if you change uh, your idea on uh, but some principal product or products, Sometimes this is, uh, may have a, a reflection on the project boundaries. And the same if you see that uh, some part of what you calculated through the methodology may be not in appropriate for you to present, you may change slightly your boundaries. So uh, all these aspects need to be consistent. Next slide, please. So uh, the application is, uh, of the methodology is um, uh, important because the methodology will be uh, useful to support applicants in quantifying the greenhouse gas emission avoidance potential over the first 10 years of operation. Uh, it will be also used to form the basis of the scoring for the greenhouse gas emission avoidance potential criterion and cost efficiency, and also to serve as uh, knowledge uh, project information for uh, uh, the project monitoring and disbursement of grants and to inform on requirements for knowledge sharing purposes. So, uh, among the other criteria, uh, a very important criteria criterion will be the potential of greenhouse gas emission avoidance. And this is uh, what the, the, one of the main purpose of the methodology. Next slide, please. The methodology will uh, allow you to calculate the absolute and relative uh, emission avoidance uh, through uh, the following equations that you see in this moment on the, on the screen. Uh, the absolute greenhouse gas emission avoidance will be basically the difference between the reference emissions and the project emissions calculated over the next 10 years, the, the, the 10 years following the, the start of the project. And this uh, result will be expressed in tons of CO2 equivalent. The relative greenhouse gas emission avoidance will be calculated by dividing the absolute greenhouse gas emission avoidance uh, divided by the reference emissions, and this will be expressed in percentage. So, as I said, the time scale is the 10 years uh, following the start of the project. Next slide, please. So, as I said in the first slide, a very important element of an application uh, is the boundaries of the project. You have to select clearly what you consider part of your project because you, uh, you will be uh, calculating all the emissions depending on this aspect. So overall, the methodology is structured with the intention of capturing the most common emission sources of uh, the emissions trading systems. Uh, such as, for example, fuel combustion in stationary and on-site vehicles, fugitive emissions in geothermal power plant and CCS projects, emissions from the transport and supply of biomass-based fuels. These, these are just examples. But there is also a list, which is clearly explained in the methodology, of emissions which are generally excluded uh, from the uh, calculation given in the methodology. So, for example, capital goods, extraction processing, emissions coming from extraction processing, refining, distribution and storage of fossil fuels, um, biogenic CO2 emissions from combustion uh, of biomass, indirect land use change. I mean, all these, and there are some other points, uh, need to be uh, checked in detail because they might lead to uh, very important errors in the application that might also lead potentially to exclusion. So these are normally emissions which we uh, do not consider in the calculation. Next slide, please. 
So when coming to uh, the classification of your project, you will always have to choose your sector for the project you, you, you are uh, proposing and submitting. There is a number of eligibility categories we have. You see them on the left column indicated. The first is energy intensive industries, which is then split in a number of sectors, more or less reflecting what we have in the ETS system. So we have refineries, iron and steel, non ferrous metals, cement and lime, glass ceramics, and construction materials. Uh, and for each of these, you will have a number of products and services you, you uh, would have to select when choosing and submitting your application. Next slide, please. I will continue with uh, uh, showing you how the sector classification is, uh, is given in the, in the methodology. So uh, energy intensive industries continue also with other sectors, pulp and paper, chemicals, hydrogen production, and then others where you will uh, find also uh, electricity, including bioelectricity, heat, including bioheat, other. So there, uh, this is also an open uh, list. Uh, where you could also have uh, additional types. Uh, then uh, we have also uh, uh, the indication that for CCS, uh, there is no actually sector. So uh, for CCS, pure CCS uh, projects, in any case, an EII sector or a, a renewable energy sector needs to be, uh, to be chosen. Uh, so that's something uh, needs to be important to, to, to be considered for CCS projects. Next slide, please. For renewable energy projects, uh, the sectors, possible sector, are uh, wind energy, solar energy, hydro ocean energy, geothermal energy, use of renewable energy outside Annex 1, and also manufacturing of components for production of renewable energy with the corresponding, corresponding products and services. For energy storage uh, category, we have uh, the sector of intraday electricity storage, other energy storage, and manufacturing of components for the produ for, uh, production of energy storage. Next slide, please. So this uh, concludes the sector classification. Uh, that we saw, uh, that we can see in the methodology. Uh, some examples of uh, how to choose uh, 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 the correct, how to classify the, the project. So let's take a, a biorefinery, then depending on the final product, the biorefinery projects need to choose either refineries, if predominantly producing fuels, or chemicals, if predominantly producing chemicals, or pulp and paper, if predominantly producing pulp and paper products. So in some cases, such as a, a bio-based substance with both fuel and chemical applications, applicant, applicants will be uh, able to choose, well, we need to choose between uh, refineries and chemicals. Uh, <clears throat> another case of interest could be direct air capture projects with CCS uh, and also waste to energy uh, projects fitted with the CCS carbon capture storage element. In, in such case, uh, the choice uh, uh, should be uh, energy intensive industries uh, other as a sector. Um, another uh, potentially interesting example. Uh, sorry, could you go back to? Yes, thank you. Uh, so um, another uh, interesting example is the direct air capture with CCU or simply a CCU project. Uh, such projects uh, must result in substitute products for the uh, products of Annex 1 of the ETS directive. And in that case, the sector to choose is the sector of the substitute product because the CCU is resulting in such, in, such, uh, in such type of products. So other uh, potentially uh, interesting 
type of examples uh, for wastewater treatment, uh, this such project can be eligible if using renewable energy. So then the sector in such case would be use of renewable energy outside Annex 1. If biofuels are produced, then refineries can be chosen. For another type is water desalination, uh, and then such a project uh, can be eligible if using renewable energy again, and then the sector is again use of renewable energy outside Annex 1. Or uh, could also be eligible due to size in, uh, by exceeding uh, the 20 megawatt. So then the sector could be EII other. Uh, next slide, please. On choice of a sector, uh, <coughs> there are some elements uh, uh, that, of it, that we need to, to stress a bit because it sometimes, and uh, we saw quite a number of issues in the previous applications in this uh, uh, when making this choice, so we would like to stress some uh, elements here. The main aim of the project may determine the sector and the reference emissions. So that, that's why we, we want to stress this is so important. Uh, if one product is clearly the only possible choice as principal product, then the choice is quite straightforward. Uh, for example, for uh, you produce wind energy, you choose uh, renewable energy sources and then wind energy as a sector. Cement production is clearly EII cement, so it's, it's one to one, it's quite easy. However, in other cases, it's a bit more complex because uh, it might be uh, influenced by the use. For example, ethanol can be used in chemicals or as a fuel. So then uh, you have to prove, as, a, as a, in your application, which is the final use of if you are producing ethanol, if you choose a given sector. So that, as I said at the beginning, there must be consistency and there is uh, the need to provide evidence, uh, supporting documents uh, when, you, when you declare uh, that, for example, your ethanol is going to be used as a chemical. So you have a contract with uh, some, uh, or you sell it uh, in, in a certain market. If <clears throat> If more than one product could be considered as principal product, uh, but all are in the same sector, this is also a uh, quite straightforward case. Uh, so, for example, different chemicals or different fuels, well, different chemicals would result in the chemical sector choice. Uh, for fuels, it would be refineries. Uh, however, you could also have the case of products from two or more sectors, um, sorry, this is a mistake, uh, for two or, uh, from two or more sectors. So you have two products for two or more sectors uh, that could potentially be considered principal. In that case, uh, you have to choose one of the sector of the principal products uh, while uh, the other product not pertaining to the chosen sector are then non-principal products and then are treated accordingly uh, uh, to the methodology section on non-principal products. Uh, this is, uh, again, also this case uh, we have seen in the past uh, a number of issues in applications uh, trying to combine uh, uh, principal products from different sectors. Beware of this case. <clears throat> uh, so, an example could be a project that produces hydrogen with electricity uh, if the main aim of the project is, well, to store otherwise curtail renewable electricity, then the sector is energy storage. Uh, if the main aim is to produce as much hydrogen as possible, then the sector is hydrogen under energy intensive industries and the reference is the EU ETS benchmark for hydrogen. If the main aim is to produce hydrogen to transport applications, then the sectors uh, is still hydrogen under EII, but reference is fossil fuel comparator for the transport fuel displaced. If it is combined with innovative renewable electricity, then either renewable electricity or energy storage or hybrid project. 
Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> in this slide, we see uh, in a snapshot a bit uh, how the the, method the greenhouse gas methodology is shaped. We have four main sections uh, on or specific sections. The initial chapter is about uh, general principles, and then we have four main uh, subsections, uh, chapters on energy intensive industries, on carbon capture and storage, on renewable electricity, heat and cooling, and on energy storage. Uh, so each of these four specific sections will include uh, the scopes, the system boundaries, aspects, the absolute and relative greenhouse gas emission avoidance, the data and parameters. Uh, to, to, to use, essentially, and then in appendix there are uh, indications for the monitoring, reporting and verification of performance. Uh, this is to be coupled with uh, other tools which are offered to applicants, uh, which are the greenhouse gas calculators, namely, I mean, Excel files that we developed to reflect and help you to uh, present your applications with, in a somehow standardized way. And also some uh, examples that uh, we will also see this afternoon a bit later on. Next slide, please. So uh, here we, uh, we show you uh, uh, some uh, definition of what we consider errors uh, under the, in the context of the innovation plan. So the first is the definition of a manifest error, so a, a conceptual intentional error that is uh, uh, very uh, um, potentially uh, negative for the application. Uh, and also when uh, these are considered as a manifest error, when they significantly influence the calculation uh, according, done according to, to the methodology. So uh, such errors normally derive from an incorrect application of the, of the methodology and normally when they also result in such a big uh, variation, then they uh, fail the proposal. The clerical errors, uh, on the contrary, are considered minor errors normally caused by inadvertent negligence in the application of formulas uh, or similar. Uh, errors. So uh, uh, th these are a bit uh, uh, important element to consider. Next slide. Uh, because now I would like to uh, indeed go through uh, a list of um, manifest errors or potential manifest errors, provided that these uh, uh, errors result actually in a, in a significant variation of the calculation. Uh, so, for example, the incorrect selection and or application of the greenhouse gas methodology section or combination of greenhouse gas methodology sections in case of hybrid projects, this could be uh, an error. The emissions uh, that are outside the scope of the greenhouse gas methodology have been included in the calculation or the proper reference scenario for the product that the project will fully or partly replace is has not been selected. Uh, not all project emissions requested in the methodology have been identified or supplied. Some reference scenario emissions added in the calculation contrary to the greenhouse gas methodology indications. Next slide, please. Then other example, potential, uh, possible examples. Double counting of emission avoidance, especially relevant for hybrid, CCS and CCU projects. Uh, potential leakage sources, uh, for example, expected methane leakage in projects involving biogas generation or CO2 leakages following capture have not identified or sufficiently accounted for in the calculations. Emission factors, PTS benchmarks or fossil fuel comparators adopted by the applicant differ from those provided in the methodology or their selection is not properly justified. Also, this is a, 
quite important uh, uh, element to consider. So when you suggest something which is still possible in the methodology, you often, uh, the methodology normally indicates that you have to justify your, your choice. Uh, any conceptual error leading to significant discrepancy in the greenhouse gas emissions calculations, including when deriving from claimed credits of non-principal products. Um, next slide, please. So now I would like to go through uh, a bit the, again, the, here we are still in the selection of uh, your, your sector and the, the uh, correct methodology section. Uh, I would like to go through the hybrid projects. Uh, so some general indications is that applicants may combine activities related to two or three eligibility categories energy intensive industry, renewable energy resources, and energy storage. In those projects, when activities are combined from these uh, categories, are referred to as hybrid projects. Uh, so projects that capture some of the CO2 generated that have products under the EII eligibility category or produce energy under the rest, they combine the calculation of the CCS component of the project following section three with the EII component following the section two or renewable energy component following section four. In this case, these would not be hybrid projects, uh, though uh, as they would be classified under EII or renewable energy sources. So, uh, next slide, please. Now, going to some specific case, if we consider the uh, EII uh, uh, and the uh, REST case, so a project combining an, a, an element of uh, energy intensive industries and an element of renewable energy, energy sources, uh, the credits will be given for the renewable energy exported. Particular attention to the correct emission factor for electricity in the different parts of the project. For example, well, the amount you see uh, for the net electricity exported from the renewable energy storage part of the project, even if the hybrid project application is submitted for an EII sector. This is a very important element. This is the value uh, that you have to use for the net electricity exported by the renewable energy sources part. Uh, own estimated emission factor is a source of manifest error. So please always use the values that we are indicating in the methodology for uh, such cases. Of course, when you calculate, you combine the two cal uh, calculation methodology sections, you have to uh, be careful of avoiding any double counting. And the, there is also a condition that we indicated in the methodology that the power from the renewable energy storage part will be preferentially supplied to local use in the EII part. Uh, this is basically to avoid uh, somehow abuses for of these possibilities. Uh, typical project is, for example, uh, to export renewable electricity and or renewable heat from an industrial plant belonging to one of the uh, energy intensive industry sectors. Next slide, please. Uh, Another hybrid case is energy intensive industries combined with uh, energy storage. So uh, the energy intensive industry emissions and the energy storage emissions need to be summed up after having uh, performed the calculation following the respective uh, methodology sections, in this case, section two and section five, uh, while removing double counting. In case of activities overlapping between the two parts, the revenue should be the guiding principles to split production activities between the two parts. That's also a, a, a guiding principle that we uh, stated in the, in the methodology. Next slide, please. The 
uh, another uh, hybrid case we uh, we could consider is when we combine a storage energy storage element with a renewable energy storage uh, uh, element so uh, it is as always important to clarify the system boundaries for the two parts uh, and then calculate the two parts following section 4 and section 5 respectively summing up them uh, of course, removing double counting, if any. And a condition that we uh, indicated is that the applicant should demonstrate that the power from the renewable energy facility will be supplied to the energy storage project when the timing of power generation is consistent with the needs of the storage facility. And may claim credit under the renewable energy uh, sources part um, for any excess power exported. The combined facility should never store power from the grid at the same time as it is exporting renewable power to the grid. Again, to have a, a meaningful uh, project. Next slide, please. So, of course, there is also the possibility to combine the three, uh, three uh, category activities. Uh, the principle will remain basically the same. So we, you will follow the respective methodology sections uh, by summing up the contributions from the three parts while uh, paying attention to avoid any, any double counting. Uh, next slide, please. So this close a bit the hybrid uh, cases. Uh, on the screen in this moment, you see uh, the equations that we uh, explain uh, in detail in the methodology. Uh, all of them are derived from the first equations that we uh, showed you at the beginning. So basically, there are always a difference between the reference emissions and the project emissions developed for the specific cases. So for EII, we have indicated the emissions uh, for the reference coming from the inputs, from the processes, products. Uh, we were combining here uh, two elements from principal and non-principal products. Uh, end of life, and for project emissions, uh, inputs, processes, again, products as a combination for products and uh, for principal and non-principal products, uh, change to in-use, and then end of life. All this is explained in detail in the methodology section number two. For CCS, we have the emissions uh, again uh, expressed as a difference between the reference and the project. In this case, the reference will be uh, basically the emissions occurring in absence of the project as a release to the atmosphere. Uh, then uh, minus the project emissions due to the capture operations due to transport operation and due to injection operations. This is explained in detail in section three of the methodology. For renewable energy sources, the, uh, the calculation will be done by uh, subtracting from the reference emissions for the electricity or heat uh, generated or producing absence of the project and the emissions of the project being mainly the ones coming from uh, bio project, uh, geothermal project, or other on-site emissions generated uh, by the project, if any. Uh, for energy storage, uh, basically it will be again this difference expressed as the reference emissions for energy, the reference emissions for the services provided, minus the uh, project emissions for the uh, on-site, coming from on-site and for energy, energy purposes. Uh, with this, I close this first part of the general uh, session. Uh, I would like to pass the floor now to Rocio. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Michele. Uh, so I'm going to continue this general part. Uh, until the end. Uh, so at this point, uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, you have already identified the appropriate methodology for your project. And now is the point where you need to start identifying the reference scenario for your project type and sector. 
the reference scenario is uh, is based on the GHG emissions that would occur in the absence of the project, and uh, they are calculated based on the assumptions that the product will be delivered under the following circumstances. Be careful with this, with the choice of uh, the reference scenario, because it can um, it can be a source of manifest and clerical errors. So, for instance, for energy intensive industries, uh, the reference scenario will be normally based on the UETS benchmarks or the fossil fuel comparators. However, there will be other cases uh, when the combination of benchmarks or the fossil fuel comparators cannot be used. Then uh, you will see more information about this in the energy intensive industry section. Uh, and even there will be the case in which you may have to build your own reference scenario. Uh, for the case of biofuels within uh, refineries in energy intensive industries, the, um, the reference scenario is the adapted fossil fuel comparator from RED2. For uh, energy intensive industries projects with CCS, the reference scenario is the CO2 that is released or available in the atmosphere in the, as in the absence of the project. For renewable electricity and bioelectricity non-dispatchable and uh, EII electricity savings projects, the reference scenario is the expected 2030 electricity mix. For renewable heat and bioheat, uh, it's a natural gas boiler. Uh, for renewable cooling, uh, it's again the expected 2030 electricity mix. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for energy storage and dispatchable renewable electricity, the reference scenario is a single cycle natural gas turbine used for peaking power. For electricity grid services within energy storage is a combined cycle natural gas turbine. For heat under energy storage is the EUTS benchmark for heat. For hydrogen storage, the EUTS benchmark for hydrogen production. And for energy storage in vehicles is a diesel fuel internal combustion engine. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so now uh, once you have identified your reference scenario, you need to start applying your projected operational data to the calculations. So we have made available for you uh, a number of tools, Excel tools, so that you can put there your calculations. Uh, there is one tool for energy storage, for REST, for EII, and for CCS. Um, also, there are a couple of tabs where you, that you can find in the Excel tools where you can see the UETS benchmarks and other emission factors that you can use for your calculations. Uh, we'll go later through the, uh, through the tools more in details. Uh, next slide, please. So regarding electricity, uh, the Innovation Fund considers uh, for the Innovation Fund projects that the grid electricity consumed is uh, zero carbon emissions. So we assume a fully decarbonized electricity mix by 2050. And this is, uh, this is for the Innovation Fund projects. And we have, uh, we have seen that there has been some, uh, it, it maybe not, was not clear enough in the previous version of the methodology how to treat electricity. So we have included in this new version. Uh, an emission, uh, a table with emission factors for the production use and or storage of grid electricity. You can find it in table uh, 1.3 in the methodology. So depending on your project, uh, you can see in this table the emission factor that you need to use for net electricity exported and for electricity consumed. As you can see, for instance, in the electricity consumed, they are all uh, zero emissions, except for the case of electricity savings projects. And be careful with this because this can be also a source of, uh, of errors. We have seen in the past some applicants that uh, were applying the local grid emission factor, uh, which would be wrong. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding transport, uh, we have seen that generally the transport emissions are excluded. However, uh, there are a few cases in which you need to consider these emissions and do the calculations. So uh, the first case is the emissions associated with CO2 transport in projects that include a CCU or a CCS element. Uh, you will see later in the CCS section that there is one specific uh, part in the project emissions dedicated to transport. The second one is when the reference scenario for one or more of the principal products is based on a physically different product that is used for a comparable function. Let's think, for instance, the case of hydrogen used for transport. In this case, the project emissions must include any emissions associated with distributing that principal product to the point of use. And when we think again about the, uh, the, the example of hydrogen used for transport, 
you need to calculate the emissions due to the distribution of the hydrogen to the point of use, to the vehicle tank in this case. And then the third case is when biomass or waste materials are used as inputs or feedstock. In this case, the project emissions must include any additional emissions associated with gathering those materials and transporting them to the first point of processing or treatment when the transport range exceeds 500 kilometers. If the range is below 500 kilometers, you don't need to take into account the transport emissions. And you can also, you can actually use your actual values or values given in the methodology. Uh, also, be careful with this because this can be a source of errors uh, if you don't include the transfer emissions when you should be including it. Uh, next slide, please. In the Excel tool, uh, you will see also one tab that is called Assumptions. And uh, you need to, to put here all the quantitative and the qualitative assumptions that you use in your calculations. So you are required to document in a transparent way all the methods and secondary data that you use to extrapolate or estimate the operational data so that uh, a more effective review can be done and uh, on the robustness of the data adopted. For example, um, you need to check whether the characteristics of the project plant are credible and in line with basic engineering principles or whether uh, these have been uh, selected in a conservative yet accurate manner. This is to avoid uh, under or overestimation of, of uh, GLG emissions. So uh, this uh, tab we also, will also be looked at by the evaluators, so be careful with this and make sure that your assumptions are robust enough. Uh, next slide, please. In the Excel table, you will also find in the reference and the project emission tabs, at the end of the table, you will find a section on data traceability. You need to fill in these columns, the columns for data traceability with a complete and transparent documentation of the parameters using the calculations and the data sources, because this will be used for the monitoring plan uh, during the implementation of the project. Uh, next slide, please. We have made also available for you a number of examples uh, so that you can check how the tool works and, and how, to, how to report all the emissions. Uh, there is one example on RES, one on CCS, one on energy storage, and then there are three examples for energy intensive industries. Uh, you can find these examples together with the, with the tools in the portal. Uh, next slide, please. In the Excel tool, there is another tab that is called checklist, and you should prepare your submission in line with uh, the points in this checklist. This checklist contains the best practices that are gathered from previous calls, uh, also from common mistakes that we have seen uh, from previous applicants. Uh, so we have, uh, we have provided you this list so that you can self-assess if you are following the best practices in calculating and presenting the GLG emissions so that you can eliminate, eliminate any possible mistakes. So uh, also please make sure to have a look at this uh, at this checklist so that you are you are following the right the right methodology and you are not forgetting anything. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once you have calculated all your project and your reference emissions, uh, there is a tab that is called summary tab uh, that is uh, contains this information here in the slide. Uh, all the information, basically the, the absolute avoidance and relative avoidance, will be transferred to this uh, summary tab. So please uh, make sure that everything was transferred correctly and you have the right values here. And once you have uh, you have done all your calculations, then uh, is the time to uh, upload the estimated GHG emissions avoidance to the portal alongside with the uh, calculation tool. Uh, next slide, please. We want to highlight a few points in this call, especially because we have made some updates of the methodology and for those of you also that applied for uh, in the previous call. Uh, now there is no sector for CO2 transport and storage. All the CCS projects have to choose an EII or REST sector. Bioelectricity and bioheat projects uh, should choose EII and other as a sector for the classification but the calculation approach still follows section four on renewable energies. Biofuel projects choose refineries and biorefineries choose refineries, chemicals, paper or pulp, depending on the principal product. Then uh, renewable heating and cooling uh, should choose the renewable energy sector, depending on the source. 
Next slide, please. Uh, we have also added two new sectors uh, in this call, which are the manufacturing of components for production of renewable energy or energy storage, and the use of renewable energy outside Annex 1. We have also introduced some clarifications on net carbon removals, and there is a specific tab that you will find in the Excel tool with these explanations. We will go through this also in the CCS section. There are a few general rules uh, to claim net carbon removals, which are the total project emission should be negative, then uh, credit for time operations does not count towards net carbon removals, and then non-principal products are not allowed to be the only source of negative emissions because uh, in some cases you may have non-principal products in the project scenario and you don't have them in the reference scenario, so this may lead to uh, some negative emissions, but these are not real negative emissions to claim under net carbon removals. Uh, next slide, please. In the renewable energy section, in the section four of the methodology, uh, the reference scenario for renewable electricity, which is the expected 2030 grid mix, has been updated with the latest reference scenario for the Fit for 55 package. And then we have made a differentiation between dispatchable and non-dispatchable electricity. Uh, in the case for dispatchable electricity is credited considering a peak power plant. So the reference scenario is based on a natural gas single open cycle turbine. For the production of components facilities, you need to take into account uh, the cumulative avoidance due to the total number of plants that are put into service each year, but the emission savings from the use of manufacturing components should be multiplied by the component's fractional contribution to the capital cost of a facility. You will, uh, you will have more details about this in the, uh, in the rest and in the energy storage section. And then uh, specific indications for hybrid projects have been provided in the methodology, including that the renewable energy part of a hybrid project must supply energy to the uh, energy intensive industries or energy storage part. Next slide, please. So now, right now we are going to start taking your questions on Slido and I guess we'll pass the floor to Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you, Michele. Um, I think that was uh, really very, very useful and uh, really in time also. A lot of information uh, you presented uh, about the methodology, uh, what to really look for when uh, you're doing your calculations, where possible errors can come from. Uh, how to choose the, the right sector, how to define the project boundary, the principal products. Uh, so a lot of information, don't hesitate uh, to watch this recording again, but of course, most importantly, reading carefully the methodology helps. And uh, always we always say that uh, specific questions, if you still have specific questions, don't hesitate to send them to the help desk. So now we have uh, time until three o'clock to answer the questions which we have received that are of uh, general nature. So we have already received a few questions which uh, fall uh, in the specific uh, sectors or sections of the methodology, such as uh, specific questions to energy intensive uh, industries, energy storage or renewable energy. We will hold on to these uh, questions for the, for the next session, so after the next uh, specific sessions. So don't be worried if you don't see your question uh, displayed, but you have asked the question. Uh, just to say that uh, we also received a few questions which are not very clear to us. Uh, we will not be showing these questions because when the question is not clear, we also are not able to provide a good answer. So if this is the case, again, uh, please uh, either reformulate your question uh, right now or in the help desk later on. So I start with the first question. Uh, is an independent third-party verification of greenhouse gas calculation necessary? And uh, is there any added value in having your greenhouse gas calculations verified by an external third party, like for the large-scale coal? So thank you for the question. It's very important indeed to make this uh, difference with the large-scale coal. In the large-scale coal, indeed, we request a th third-party verification, which we don't request for the small-scale small scale coal. So it is not necessary. That is the answer to the first question. Is there any added value in having your greenhouse gas calculations verified? We have done everything possible to have a very clear methodology 
so you can actually do the calculations without uh, further help from consultants or without uh, this uh, th third party verification. So it is really up to you to see if for more complex project you would request uh, such third third party verification but uh, we would rather advise you to actually if you have any doubts to ask specific questions to the help desk we think that this can be even more helpful than having a third party verify because third party verification also depends on very good understanding of what we request in the methodology so if you do that if you ask for somebody else to verify make sure that this third party actually has a good understanding of our methodology, the way we have described it and about the requirements specific to the innovation fund. So, next question. Results from the first call show that relative greenhouse gas avoidance can be low. Is there a guide for the minimum required improvement in greenhouse gas emissions for application? In fact, the results uh, from the first calls show that the relative greenhouse gas emission avoidance is actually quite high. You, quite often it is 100%, 90%, or even sometimes above 100%. Uh, and uh, there are some cases where greenhouse gas, relative greenhouse gas emission is lower, uh, more specifically in energy in intensive industries, but there is no minimum requirement. And we acknowledge that in some sectors it is more difficult to reduce emissions to 100 percent and uh, you should not be worried of course if the results show that uh, your relative emission avoidance is only 10 percent perhaps that is too low indeed but there is no minimum requirement and uh, the score is uh, the total score of a project will be as explained in the morning combined score on the five criteria, criteria we have and relative emission avoidance is actually one out of three criteria under greenhouse gas emission avoidance. So next question. It seems some new sub criteria under greenhouse gas emissions calculation, net carbon removals and changes to energy intensive industry storage more than 50 years so that is uh, concerns i suppose uh, storage in materials that needs to be more than 50 years strongly favors ccs projects projects please explain i will try to explain <laughs> so net carbon removals uh, is uh, not new in fact we had it in the first small scale call as encouraged activity uh, yes, we are favoring net carbon removals, that is true. This is a specific family of technologies that uh, we see we need uh, special support because they are key to reaching uh, climate neutrality objectives. Uh, so it is important to support them. Some of those technologies perhaps uh, are less mature or will sco score lower, for example, on cost efficiency. And this is why we have a specific focus on net carbon removals. That's, uh, that is like that. Uh, now, the second part of the question, which relates to storage in materials, that uh, it is true that CCS, or rather geological storage of CO2, uh, for the moment is one of the few pathways which ensures permanence of the storage, and that's why there is the the, this difference between storage in materials and storage, geological storage. However, in fact, uh, in this uh, version of the methodology, we provide clear guidance before, in fact, we didn't have any specific rule for storage in materials, and we were actually making it more difficult for these projects by not having these specific rules. Uh, rule. So we believe that actually uh, this is a fair treatment, uh, both with regards to net carbon removals and storage in materials. And just to say that uh, CCS perhaps is too big for the small scale, of course, uh, we do have some uh, CCS projects also in the small scale call. So, what sector is related with the biomass vapor boiler? A biomass boiler could be included in these innovation funds. Maybe I pass uh, this question to the JRC colleagues. 
Uh, yes, so <clears throat> uh, for this question, uh, we propose this answer. I think uh, if the project produces electricity and or heat, this is uh, how we understood, uh, as the principal product, uh, then the appropriate sector would be uh, EII other. Uh, I take also uh, the opportunity to, to underline that in this case, uh, the methodology section to follow would be in any case section four on renewable energy sources this is important but for classification of the project uh, it would be eii other uh, if the biomass boiler was installed to supply electricity or heat uh, for uh, for use in production of another product an application could be made in the sector of that specific product Thank you, Michele. So I believe this answer was quite clear. So uh, see what is actually the final product uh, where you will actually have be using this biomass boil in your innovation, but it's important to see what the final product is. And uh, just to say EII is energy intensive industry. Sometimes we use abbreviations, perhaps not very, very clear to the Sorry. outside world. No, no problem. So I, I believe this is the last question which we have received of uh, general nature, so related to the first part of the presentation we did. Uh, so we will wait actually five minutes now before we start the next session at exactly three o'clock, which will be on energy intensive industries. So thank you for your patience. Uh, for those who will join us a little bit later at three o'clock exactly, we will start at three.
Good afternoon again. So we pass now uh, to the second part uh, in the afternoon presentations. Uh, so our colleagues in JRC will explain the calculations of greenhouse gas emission avoidance in specific to energy intensive industries, including carbon capture and utilization, substitute products and biofuels. So I will pass the floor to Ekaterini Conti to walk you through the slides. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. Some uh, key points for uh, the energy intensive industries applications that sh you should have in mind uh, are that it is very important to include a complete diagram with all the processes and inputs uh, in your application and in the Excel file that I, I will also show you later. It is also very important to use the hierarchy of literature sources, which can be found in Appendix 1 of the methodology. Uh, and uh, you should justify uh, convincingly the choice of values if more than one value is available at the same level of the literature hierarchy. In particular, uh, this is important if this, could, uh, this wrong choice could lead to an underestimation of project emissions or an overestimation of the reference emissions. Next slide, please. Uh, as uh, Mikel uh, told you before, uh, the overall uh, principle is that uh, the emission savings are the change in emissions of, of the project compared to the reference scenario over uh, the first uh, 10 years. Uh, these emissions are classified for the energy intensive industries into uh, different boxes. These are the inputs, the processes, the uh, combustion, the change to in use, the end of life, and the non-principal products. Uh, the change to in use appears only in the project scenario, and I will explain you later uh, what should be uh, uh, put into each one of these boxes. But this is the, the general uh, diagram that you should keep in mind. Uh, with the processes, we mean uh, the processes that they produce uh, the principal products of the project. These processes are under the control of the applicant and uh, they, they use the EU ETS calculation rules and the monitoring, reporting and verification rules. Uh, next slide, please. In the previous uh, call, we saw that the applicants uh, had uh, some difficulties in identifying the appropriate reference scenario for their project. Uh, this is why uh, in this call, uh, we have uh, constructed seven basic cases that the applicants should follow. The first case is uh, uh, when uh, an EU ETS product benchmark uh, corresponds to the production of the principal product. Uh, exists, this benchmark should be the basis for the reference scenario. For example, uh, if we have a, if we consider a project that produces hot metal, the reference scenario uh, would be a combination of the benchmarks for coke, sintered ore and hot metal. The expected consumption per unit of output of the intermediate products that are used in the production of the final product, which is hot metal in this case, uh, may be considered as the emissions from coke uh, and sintered ore uh, production are not included in the hot metal benchmark uh, per se. Uh, in the second case, uh, an appropriate reference scenario may be constructed from an EU ETS product uh, and benchmark uh, sub-installations. These are heat, fuel or others. For example, uh, a project uh, manufacturing cold drone steel bars may be able to construct a reference scenario in which the processes box is based on combination of the product benchmark uh, for hot metal and uh, a fuel benchmark sub-installation reflecting additional fuel consumption for the drawing process. Next slide, please. Uh, in the third case, uh, which is a very common case, uh, the project is a modification to an existing production system uh, and the applicant may choose to use the existing, the unmodified production system as the reference scenario. Uh, 
But this case is subject to very specific conditions and the applicants should be very careful and read carefully uh, the methodology. Uh, for example, if a steam uh, methane reformer at an oil refinery is replaced with an electrolyzer and the principal product is identified as hydrogen, this could not be treated as a modification as the main element of the hydrogen production system is entirely replaced. If, however, refined hydrocarbon fuels were treated as the principal product, then the project could be treated as a modification in the context of this wider production system. Uh, a, a possible manifest error that we have uh, in this case is that the modified plant uh, is not below the relevant EU ETS benchmark. For the calculation of the emission savings, the reference would be uh, the unmodified production system. But in any case, the modified plant should be below the benchmark. Next slide, please. Uh, in our fourth case, uh, in our, our fourth case, uh, the principal product uh, is a transport fuel substitute. So the reference scenario should be based on the Innovation Fund fossil fuel comparator values. For example, uh, if we have a project that produces hydrogen, hydrogen is supplied to fuel cell vehicles. It substitutes. Uh, it substitutes the transport function of conventional cars running on fossil fuel. So the reference scenario for the substituted function is the consumption of the fossil fuel required for a comparable conventional car to transport the same load and equal distance. The fossil fuel comparators can be uh, found uh, in the methodology in uh, table 2.2. Uh, however, uh, if uh, uh, we don't have evidence that hydrogen will be used for uh, transport, the correct reference scenario would be a generic hydrogen production. And, the and in this case, the EUTS hydrogen benchmark should be used. Uh, you should be very careful uh, in that because this could lead to a manifest error and could make uh, the, the project fail. Either if you select the, the benchmark and you have a transport uh, a specific uh, application, or if you select the fossil fuel comparator and uh, it is not uh, justified. Uh, next slide, please. In the fifth case, uh, the principal product uh, is a natural gas substitute. So the reference scenario in this case should be based on the combustion emission this intensity of natural gas. For example, uh, if uh, uh, we have uh, a project producing renewable gas, which will be fed into natural gas grid, uh, the reference scenario has to be assumed that uh, it, it would be uh, the general combustion emissions intensity uh, of natural gas. Um, if, however, the disposition of the natural gas substitute is known, for example, its transport or industrial use, then the reference scenario should reflect the emissions associated with providing uh, that equivalent function. Uh, in this case, a possible manifest error is uh, the incorrect uh, selection of the incorrect reference if the use is known. Next slide, please. In our sixth case, uh, the principal product, uh, we have a principal product that can be synthesized from natural gas, for example, methanol. And we will see also an example on that below. Uh, in this case, we have an emission value available in the input data hierarchy in our appendix one for the production of that principal product with natural gas as the primary feedstock. So this value should be used as the reference scenario, but uh, subtracting 15%, uh, uh, which, uh, which accounts for the upstream emissions in order to be in line with how the EU ETS benchmarks have been calculated. 
for example, uh, we have a project that produces propylene as the sole uh, principal product. The EU ETS benchmark for uh, steam cracking uh, high value chemicals cannot be used as a reference because it's not the, the only uh, principal product and there is a specific composition uh, in the mixture of the high value chemicals. So this would be a manifest error if this uh, reference uh, was selected. Uh, and on the other hand, the applicant uh, should look through sources in the data hierarchy to find a life cycle emission value for propylene production from steam cracking of natural gas liquids and use that value. As I, as I said, reduced by 15% uh, if appropriate. Next slide, please. Well, if uh, a reference scenario cannot be built uh, based on these six uh, cases, uh, we have the seventh uh, case, which is uh, that the applicant uh, must propose an appropriate reference scenario uh, for the, the production of, of the principal product with clear justification and provide a robust uh, characterization of the emissions associated with the system. If it is possible to construct a reference scenario using one of the previous six cases, uh, it would be a manifest error to just propose uh, a, a, another uh, scenario. Uh, next slide, please. And now let's move to the boxes that we saw in the general uh, diagram uh, before. Uh, in the processes box, uh, we have the process emissions within the project boundaries in both scenarios, in the reference and the project, to produce the same quantity of the principal products or deliver an, an equivalent function. Uh, in projects uh, with carbon capture and storage uh, elements, the full amount of uh, CO2 generated by the project should be included as a positive emission term or as zero in, in the case that we have biogenic CO2, even though some of this CO2 is to be captured. The CCS credit calculated according to the methodology in section three shall be included as a separate negative emission term. Uh, in the same logic, with, uh, for projects the, with the carbon capture and utilization elements, uh, they need to demonstrate that the captured CO2 will be used. As for CCS, the full amount of CO2 generated by the project should be included as a positive emission term or as a zero in the case of biogenic CO2. Uh, and then uh, also all emissions associated with carb capture, transport and incorporation of the CO2 uh, which is a negative term, uh, uh, should also be fully accounted as a separated term in this box. Uh, a possible manifest error that we have seen here is the wrong treatment of non-principal products. Uh, many applicants in the past have treated them as co-principal products, creating a reference for them in their reference scenario. Uh, we will see that the uh, non-principal products uh, have a specific uh, place uh, where they appear. Next slide, please. Uh, in the input box, uh, the in should be included the inputs that enter the system boundary associated with the processes boxes. Uh, here, uh, both energy and material inputs are included. Uh, emissions factors from the data hierarchy from Appendix 1 should be used and uh, on the contrary, uh, EU ETS benchmarks uh, should not be used or own estimated emission factors which would probably inflate the, the reference emissions and this would uh, be a manifest error. Uh, the EU ETS benchmarks generally uh, do not include input emissions so uh, in this case you should check what inputs are included and which are not. Uh, the ones that are not should be included in the inputs box of the reference scenario. For the project scenario and also for the reference scenario under case three, the modification of an existing production system, 
The applicant, you, uh, may choose to bring the production of any input into the processes box and assess these emissions directly. Uh, this requires, of course, that uh, you're able to identify the source of that input and to cooperate with the producer uh, of that input. Uh, inputs are uh, classified into two uh, categories, the elastic and rigid inputs. Uh, for the elastic inputs, we have a, simpl a simplification. Uh, we have, first of all, the de minimis inputs that uh, have joint emissions of less than 5% of the total emissions ascribed to the inputs, and those emissions can be neglected. And all the other inputs must be considered and calculated based on the emission factors from the data hierarchy. Next slide, please. Um, concerning the rigid inputs, uh, these are inputs with a fixed supply. So they can only be supplied to a new innovation fund project by diverting them from another use or disposition. For example, we have municipal waste or used uh, plastics or uh, used lubricating oil or waste heat. So in this case, we need to consider uh, the impact of diverting uh, those inputs from their existing use. And we have uh, four cases. Uh, in the first case, the diversion is expected to increase the demand for one or more elastic inputs. So the rigid input should be replaced in the input box with the relevant quantities of the elastic inputs. Um, in the second case, the diversion is expected to increase the demand for other rigid or semi-elastic inputs. So, uh, we should uh, assess the diversion of inputs until they have been fully characterized as a combination of elastic inputs. Uh, in the third case, the diversion is expected to create no additional demand for other inputs. Uh, these inputs, for example, would otherwise have been disposed without any productive use. Uh, so changes in emissions due to changing the disposition of the input should be counted as the emissions intensity of the input. Uh, for example, the emissions attributed to using municipal waste, which is currently being incinerated without uh, energy recovery, uh, are uh, negative. Um, and in, in the fourth case, uh, we have a combination of the previous three cases, and uh, in, in this case, we should assess its input as above, as I, I explained to you, and, uh, and combine them to give the overall emissions implication of, of use of, the, of that read, uh, the input. Next slide, please. Uh, then the, the next box we have is the change to in use. This is a, a box that appears only in the project scenario and not in the reference scenario. Uh, and this box allows to claim credit when the characteristics of innovative products may uh, save emissions in the use phase of the principal product. For example, if we, have, if we have an innovative nitrogen compound to use as fertilizer that uh, reduces N2O emissions compared to conventional nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, this uh, changes uh, to, to in-use emissions need to be well justified and based on a, a realistic use uh, case. Uh, the savings also, it's very important, must be enabled directly by the properties of the produced product. And this product should not be used as an input for a second product that will deliver the in use savings. Next slide, please. Uh, in the combustion emissions, uh, we have uh, the combustion emissions uh, that occur when the principal products are combusted for energy purposes, for example, novel transport fuels or fuel additives or solid fuels and natural gas substitutes. 
Uh, for the novel transport fuels, uh, the IF, the Innovation Fund Fossil Fuel Comparator, uh, includes already the combustion emissions for the reference scenario. So, uh, in the project scenario, so there is no need, and it's actually wrong, to include again the combustion emissions in the reference scenario. But in the project scenario, uh, the stoichiometric combustion emissions uh, should be. Uh, included. Uh, considering the end-of-life emissions, uh, these are the emissions that occur with the disposal or recycling of a principal product after the end of its useful life. Uh, if the carbon, if carbon is incorporated in the material on a long-term basis, and long-term we mean uh, above 50, more than 50 years, 50% of the CO2 emissions from the stoichiometric combustion may be included in this box. Um, the combustion or end-of-life emissions for CCU products are not affected by the source of the captured CO2, if it's biogenic or fossil. However, combustion and end-of-life emissions associated with carbon that enters the project boundaries in biogenic inputs, other than captured CO2, are counted as zero as normal. Uh, a, a, a manifest error that we have seen here is to include uh, a credit for the avoided primary polymer production due to increased recyclability. This is not something uh, in line with uh, the methodology of the Innovation Fund. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, in the non-principal products box, we have uh, emissions related to the co-products that are produced when producing the same quantity of principal products or deliver an equivalent function in the reference and project scenarios. Uh, these uh, non-principal products are outside the project boundaries. Uh, it is important that they are claimed only in the scenario in which they are produced. And uh, emission factors from the data hierarchy should be used. A frequent error that we have seen is that many applicants in the past have used only combustion, uh, combustion only uh, emission factors. Uh, in this in this case of the non product of the non principal products, uh, we have a credit which is a negative emissions term in, in the emissions term uh, in the scenario where uh, these non-principal products are produced, which is equal to minus one for the credit multiplied with the quantity of the non-principal product and the emission factor of that product. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here we have a list of possible sources of manifest errors in the energy intensive industries. This list is not uh, exhaustive. Uh, there are some, just some of the most common errors that we have seen uh, in previous calls. For uh, example, uh, the principal products and the reference products they substitute, uh, as well as their quantities, are not correctly identified or uh, the principal products uh, do not represent the main objective of the project, or principal products are not all in the same sector. Mm. Reference emissions uh, created in the reference scenario for a non-principal product uh, that is produced only in the project scenario, as I also told you also before. Uh, for a new plant, the reference scenario uh, is not uh, sufficiently built from EU ETS benchmarks, so it should be a combination of benchmarks or sub-benchmarks, as I told you before, uh, in, in case uh, two. Uh, for uh, a project which modifies an existing plant, the modified plant uh, fails to meet the relevant EU ETS benchmark. Uh, or um, rigid inputs are not correctly identified and alternative uses of, that in, of those inputs are not uh, uh, identified as well. Uh, or another uh, potential problem is that uh, not all additional inputs and processing steps have been considered. Next slide, please. 
And now we will see a, a, a very easy, uh, very simple calculation example. Uh, uh, next slide, please to see how the methodology works in, in practice. Uh, let's assume that we have uh, a project that intends to produce uh, green hydrogen. Uh, this example uh, intends only to show important aspects of how the methodology works in practice and where possible errors could occur. And uh, the slides are included uh, only for illustrative purposes. You can access a quantitative version of this example and uh, other examples in, in the portal. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh, I will show you directly one example uh, later. Um, so uh, let's state in the green hydrogen example for now. Uh, this is a, an example, it's a project that uh, falls within the energy intensive industry. Hydrogen is the only and therefore obviously the principal product of the project. The sector is hydrogen and uh, hydrogen is applied for industrial use. Uh, you can, can see also, you can access in, in the link we have provided you, uh, the data which we have used to, to build this uh, example. Next slide, please. So we have this general diagram that uh, we have seen also before, and uh, we will see now uh, which boxes which should, uh, we should uh, fill in order to calculate the emissions avoidance. Next slide, please. So for the reference scenario, uh, an ETS benchmark for hydrogen exists. So we have we are under the case one that I uh, explained to you before. Uh, in this case, there are no additional inputs that we should uh, include uh, in order to build our reference. For the project scenario, uh, our uh, main process is electrolysis. And for the electrolysis, we need power uh, if it's not a, a process that would be included in the process box, water and heat for high temperature electrolysis. For the power generation, uh, the renewable power production could be placed within the project boundary as a process or outside the boundary as an input. Uh, and in any case, emission factor uh, for the electricity consumed is zero because, as uh, Rothian and Mikhail explained to you before, we assume that uh, in 2050, uh, the grid electricity uh, GHG uh, intensity would be zero. Next slide, please. So, uh, if we uh, focus on, on the heat, uh, the, the heat is required uh, in our example for high temperature electrolysis, and there are two options. Either uh, the heat would be generated by direct fossil fuel combustion, and uh, in this case, we should include those combustion emissions as part of the electrolysis process. So, heat would not be any, any input, would be in the processes box, or heat uh, could be supplied from outside the project unit. And in this case, we must identify the source and assess, uh, and assess it as an input. Uh, as we saw before, the inputs are classified into rigid and uh, elastic inputs. So uh, if the heat is a byproduct from other processes, then uh, we should treat it as uh, a rigid input and, ident and identify any emissions due to its uh, diversion from its current use. Otherwise, heat should be treated as an elastic input and uh, we should assess the actual GHG emissions for the heat generation. Uh, here, uh, an important error may occur, so the non-identification of rigid inputs or incorrect identification of the alternative use of uh, the input could lead to uh, possible manifest errors and uh, you should be very careful on that. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, here uh, we see the project diagram that uh, we said it's very important to, to include uh, of our project. Uh, and we, we have uh, the electrolyzer as does input power, water and heat. And our final product is hydrogen. Uh, for the reference uh, case, we have just the ATS benchmark for hydrogen and the final product is, of course, hydrogen. So the emission uh, avoidance would be, uh, the emission savings would be the difference between uh, the benchmark for hydrogen and uh, the emissions from the electrolyzer. Next slide, please. Uh, in order to, to put some numbers to make it more realistic, uh, for the reference, we have the ATS benchmark uh, for hydrogen, which is 6.84 tons CO2 equivalent per ton of hydrogen. Uh, and for the project, we have, uh, as we said, uh, zero emissions from the power, zero emissions uh, also for uh, the water, provided that uh, there is no desalination or pumping or uh, energy in intensive activities uh, related to the supply of the water. And uh, for our third input for heat, uh, we have 59.1 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per terajoule. Uh, and uh, 0 0.0032 terajoules per ton of hydrogen. So uh, finally, we, we have 0 0.189 ton CO2 per ton of hydrogen. Uh, here, I forgot to mention that a, an important manifest error that may occur is to consider the emission factor of the local grid and not the uh, not zero as uh, explained for the uh, consumption uh, of electricity in the innovation fund projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, we have the general diagram. You see uh, in the reference, we have only the, the processes box with the ETS benchmark. And uh, in the project, uh, we have uh, the emissions related to, to heat. So uh, if we uh, have uh, 100,000 tons uh, hydrogen uh, per year, uh, our reference emissions would be this 6.84 tons CO2 per ton of hydrogen multiplied with 100,000 uh, tons hydrogen per year, and this multiplied with the 10 years, giving uh, 684,000 ton, oh, no, 6,840,000 tons CO2. And for the project uh, emissions, we would have uh, 0 0.189 tons CO2 uh, per tons of hydrogen multiplied with the, the output and uh, the 10 years giving uh, 180, uh, 188,960 uh, tons CO2 equivalent. So we uh, calculate uh, the absolute greenhouse gas emissions, simply uh, subtract, subtracting the project emissions from the reference emissions. And then uh, we uh, divide this number with the reference emissions to get uh, the relative emission avoidance, which is 97%. Next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, we actually don't have uh, the Q&A session now. Uh, I will have to show you another example uh, from uh, directly from the tool that you can find uh, in the portal. So, uh, Marta, I don't know how we do that. Are we ready? Can I project? Yes, you can take over. Oops, excuse me.
Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, is it visible uh, apart from, do you have to make it bigger or can you read? Maybe something? you can make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Thank you, Marta. I think it's okay. Um, so, uh, this is uh, an example that you can find uh, in, in the portal, and uh, I will just show you how this uh, tool looks like. Um, we have a project that intends to produce methanol, and uh, starting from the process diagram that is easier to understand the project, uh, this project foresees the construction of a biomass gasifier and electrolyzer to feed a methanol synthesis unit. The plant will use biomethane as the main gasifier uh, feed, plus grid electricity and uh, a fossil natural gas boiler for heat. The syngas from the gasifier will be complemented in the methanol synthesizer uh, synthesizer a feed by CO2 captured from an off-site point source and hydrogen from the electrolyzer. So here uh, you have uh, the, the project uh, diagram. Now, if we go to the calculation, uh, first of all, the project uh, the projected production would be 100,000 tons methanol per year once the facility reaches its full capacity, which is projected to happen in year three. Uh, as this uh, project belongs to the energy intensive industries uh, category, of course. Uh, the sector is chemicals and the product is organic basic chemicals and precisely methanol. So, uh, the calculation should follow the section two uh, of the methodology. As uh, stated in the greenhouse gas avoidance methodology for the energy intensive industries, the reference scenario for methanol may be based on the estimated GHG intensity uh, of production of methanol from natural gas. It's the, the sixth case that we uh, discussed before. Uh, in the methodology, this is uh, 82.5 grams CO2 equivalent per megajoule. Uh, since there is no direct ETS benchmark for standalone methanol production. Um, so, looking at the emissions, in the reference um, emissions, uh, we have only uh, uh, the processes uh, box that should be uh, included, should be filled. Uh, in the blue uh, boxes, you see the output per year. You see 50,000 uh, tons the first year, 75,000 uh, in the second, and then the, for the rest of, of the years, it's 100,000. Uh, in the green boxes, uh, we have um, the calculation that the actual emissions. So, uh, since the emission factor is expressed here, uh, is expressed uh, in a gram CO2 equivalent per megajoule, apart from this emission factor and the output per year, uh, we also need the net calorific value in order to calculate uh, the emissions per year. Uh, as you see here, we have another two other tabs, the ref reference conversion factors and the project uh, conversion factors. Let's see, for example, here, the reference conversion factors. And here we have this value for methanol, that the, the value that uh, you saw before. This list is not exhaustive, of course, but it, it contains uh, some very common uh, values that you could uh, use. If uh, project-specific values are required, you can uh, add uh, 
uh, cells below uh, here in, in these two tabs. So, uh, returning here, uh, we have, for example, for our first year, uh, the emissions, which are uh, the result of the multiplication of the output, uh, of the net calorific value, and of the emission factor. And here we have, in, in the end, the total emissions uh, per year, the total emissions uh, in the 10 years, which is also reflected here in the summary tab. Uh, this is uh, our, our reference scenario uh, for uh, the project emissions. The project scenario includes several inputs, several processes, uh, and the, the end-of-life uh, emissions of, of methanol. We don't have in this case uh, combustion emissions or change to in-use emissions because we have the, the same product in the reference and in the uh, project scenario. And we also don't have additional uh, products and additional non-principal products. So uh, for the inputs, you see here, uh, we have uh, um, biomethane, electricity, water, uh, and the catalyst consumption. Again, we, we, you see in the uh, blue boxes, in the blue cells, uh, the amounts that we need for its uh, process and its year. And in the green cells, we have uh, the uh, calculated uh, emissions. For biomethane, as uh, we did before, uh, for methanol, we uh, need uh, the uh, net calorific value and the emission factor that, again, you can see here, here uh, in the reference conversion factors and the project conversion factors. And we calculate uh, the emissions per year and then uh, the total emissions for the 10 years. Um, then, uh, as we said before, electricity consumption is, uh, uh, has zero emissions or water consumption. In any case, the blue boxes, the blue cells should be uh, filled for monitoring, reporting and verification reasons. But as you see here, the green cells are empty, meaning that there are no uh, emissions associated uh, with these inputs. Uh, we also have uh, uh, as an input uh, the consumption of catalyst, which for this example we assume uh, that it is a, a de minimis input, so an input that can be neglected. But uh, the potential applicant, you, should provide indicative emissions uh, factors from the data hierarchy for the catalyst used in order to confirm this uh, de minimis uh, status. Then moving to the processes, <clears throat> we have uh, the gas boiler, uh, the uh, carbon capture unit, and uh, the methanol synthesizer, for which we have uh, two entries because uh, we have uh, part of uh, CO2, which is released uh, from exhaust gas, uh, from biomethane and a part uh, which is uh, released uh, from CO2 <clears throat> in order to, to see the difference between the biogenic and the uh, fossil uh, materials. So uh, we uh, calculate again uh, here in our green cells the its emission and you will see <clears throat> that for the captured uh, uh, CO2, we have an emission factor of minus one uh, in order to give this uh, credit. The, also, uh, you see that these uh, uh, green cells uh, are empty, are zero, because they correspond to the biogenic part of, of the CO2 that is re released. Whereas for the fossil part, we have uh, calculated, as always, the, the emissions. Then uh, we move to the end-of-life emissions. 
Uh, and again, since we have a part which is biogenic and a part which is fossil, we have to make this distinction. And uh, this uh, distinction is made uh, here, the, the fraction in this cell actually. Here, you see the, the output is multiplied uh, with the ratio of the biogenic input uh, um, divided with the total uh, uh, CO2. So we have uh, the fraction of biogenic uh, carbon calculated using the ratio of mass of biogenic carbon and carbon sources, which is 12 divided with 16. It's the molecular weight of carbon uh, divided with the molecular uh, weight of methane, which it has four uh, hydrogen uh, atoms. Uh, and uh, the, the, the total carbon uh, in inputs also uh, um, with uh, the biomethane input uh, and uh, the uh, CO2 input, which is, again, we see the molecular weights is uh, 12 for the carbon and uh, 44 the molecular weight of uh, CO2. Uh, which has uh, two uh, atoms of oxygen. And again, you see that for the biogenic part, we have uh, zero emissions. These uh, green cells are empty, whereas we have calculated uh, the uh, 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 emissions for uh, the non-biogenic carbon. And uh, we have the total emissions in this uh, column, the AK, which is then reflected in the total uh, emissions of the project that you see here. And uh, finally, uh, we have uh, the accumulated greenhouse gas emission avoidance, which is the difference, as we said, between the reference emissions and the project emissions. And in order to calculate the relative uh, emission avoidance, we have uh, the uh, project emissions divided with uh, the reference emissions uh, here. And in our case, this gives uh, a 50% uh, emissions avoidance. Um, yes, uh, well, I will stop sharing the Excel file and, yep, thanks. And uh, we could move to the Q&A session. Thank if you, you very ready. much, uh, Ekaterini. Uh, this was a very extensive uh, explanation of the calculation methodology for energy intensive industries and uh, an explanation of an example, a uh, very detailed one. Hopefully, this is very helpful to every applicant that intends to submit an application in energy intensive industries. Uh, we, we know that this is perhaps the more complex part of the methodology. This is why uh, we took uh, more time to explain really in detail all the elements of this methodology. Well, all elements to the extent possible in the time given. Uh, just to say that uh, these examples are available through the funding and tenders portal, so don't hesitate to download them and even play with the Excel sheets before you actually create your own calculation. Now, I go directly to the first question that is uh, being asked, uh, which is, if EU ETS product benchmark is available, is it compulsory to use it as a reference scenario, or can we use the real emissions before project implementation? So, JRC colleagues, what do you say? If, uh, well, <laughs> I go, right? Uh, if the available EU ETS product benchmark uh, boundaries fully correspond to the project boundaries, uh, then uh, uh, this benchmark uh, must be used as reference. For more variegated boundaries and situations, uh, 
the applicant should see the other six possible cases described in uh, the methodology in section 2.2.4. Uh, the real emissions before the project implementation could only be used in the case of a modification of an existing plant, given that the conditions specified in the methodology for this case are met. And again, uh, all, well, no. Uh, yes, I, I think it's enough. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Indeed, uh, that is enough, and it's uh, very important to pay attention. It more. <laughs> indeed, if there is an ETS benchmark, uh, because this is a specific case and can lead to errors if it is not used. So, next question is: If your product substitutes another material with a worse carbon profile, like steel, can we easily use the known figures of greenhouse gas for steel production? So, Ekaterini. Project uh, producing steel must develop a reference emission scenario for conventional steel production based on the guidance on the GHG emission avoidance methodology. Um, this will generally be based on the EU ETS benchmarks relevant to steel production. And again, the methodology, the same section of the methodology, section 2.2.4, uh, provides further details on how this should be done. Thank you. So, next question. We are a chloralkali industry. In case to buy green electricity is possible, consider the project of purify and compress hydrogen to use as a fuel in vehicles. Well, a bit difficult to understand we, the question. If we but understand correctly the question, yes. uh, it would be possible to make an application under the energy intensive industries. Uh, and the sector would be refineries for such a project. If hydrogen is uh, going to be used in, uh, in vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just perhaps to add that uh, if hydrogen is used in vehicles, they, uh, the projects should show some evidence uh, that this indeed will be the case. And definitely this will have to be proven if the project is selected and uh, receiving the grant in the time when the project is in operation, there has to be a proof that hydrogen is indeed sold for use in vehicles. So, next question. For some sectors, ETS benchmark value includes electricity, whereas uh, innovation fund small scale coal considers a zero scope two emission, emission factor zero for electricity. Do you manage this difference? How do you manage this difference? Uh, in, in any case, the benchmark should be used as it is in the reference scenario. Uh, applicants uh, are not required and should not attempt even to recalculate benchmarks, even if they include some electricity emissions. So they would use uh, the zero emissions in the project scenario, but the, in the reference scenario where the benchmarks are used should be used uh, as they are. Next question. Compared to last round, ETS benchmarks may have decreased up to 24%. Did you assess the impact on avoidance scoring? So, yes, that is true indeed that ETS benchmarks have been revised uh, and uh, they have been decreased for a number of the products. Uh, however, uh, this doesn't really matter for the scoring because uh, projects uh, have to select the correct sector and, in fact, the emission avoidance w normally would have be de been decreased for all uh, projects in the same sector using the same benchmark. So, in fact, there will not be an impact on the score per se of absolute emission avoidance. So, next question, is the greenhouse gas calculation file provided aligned to the EU ETS benchmark or a new file shall be provided as evidence of the rectifi rectification against the, the EU ETS? Ekaterini, do you understand no, uh, this? There Yes. <laughs> well, also my colleagues have, uh, have helped. <laughs> uh, yes, there is no need to submit an additional file, but applicants must clearly identify any relevant uh, benchmarks and provide explicit comparison where uh, this is relevant. 
Thank you very much. So these are the questions which we have received uh, for this session. Uh, we are a little bit behind time, uh, but I think this was extremely useful and necessary. So in, uh, this is why we're not going to have any more breaks. Uh, we go, we move directly to the session on carbon capture and storage. Uh, and uh, please, uh, Rocio, the floor is yours. Rocio, we can't see you and we don't hear you either. No, I don't know if you are speaking, but we cannot really <laughs> hear you. She has left the meeting, uh, so she's going out and, and coming back, I, I guess. I don't know if we can move to the following one or we... The next one is Michele. I don't know if you could take the... the ne well, I will have to jump all the slides. Maybe I would wait for two minutes for Rothio to see if she can come back. Yes, let's wait uh, in order not to jump back and forth also because we have announced uh, the, ag the agenda that we will start with the next session on renewable energy only at half past four. So, uh, well, sorry for those people watching us. Uh, this is the beauty of online connections. Uh, Let's hope that our colleague uh, who will do the presentation is able to connect.
Our colleague Rocio has a bit of a connection issue, so Michele has uh, agreed to, to step in. Thank you, Michele, very much. Uh, so we will continue with, uh, now with carbon capture and storage. Uh, yes, uh, uh, so uh, next slide, please. We will go through now uh, through some Sorry, slides. Michele, uh, I managed please. to, to join something, something very weird happened <laughs> with my computer just in the moment of the presentation. But anyway, I'm glad that I'm on time. Uh, okay, so I will continue with the uh, with this part on carbon capture and storage. Uh, so these projects uh, aim to capture and compress in CO2 from point sources or from the air uh, for injection in a storage site. Uh, it is important to know that applications can be submitted by any players in the CCS supply chain, but uh, you need to demonstrate the provision of the remaining services. Uh, for energy intensive industries and renewable energy projects with a CCS component, the CCS part is calculated according to this section that we are uh, that we are introducing now, and this uh, this part of CCS is introduced in the EII or the REST GIG calculations. Uh, important also to notice that there is no difference between the CO2 capture from fossil and biogenic sources because the biogenic CO2 credit is given to the emitting facility. We're going to see an example of this later. So here you have the main equation for the uh, absolute GIG avoidance of CCS which is uh, the reference emissions minus the project emissions. Uh, the reference emissions if there is the REV release, which is a CO2 that would be released or available in the atmosphere in the absence of the project activity, minus the project emissions, which is composed by uh, the project capture. So these are the emissions from the CO2 capture activities. Uh, the uh, emissions from the pipeline, which are the emissions from transport of CO2 by pipelines, then emissions uh, of other means of transport uh, by road, rail, or maritime, and then the emissions due to injection in the geological storage site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here you have the equations that you need to use to calculate your project emissions for the transport for the road, rail, or maritime. Uh, you will need to calculate, well, you will need to know first the kilometers that you are going to be transporting the CO2, then the amount of CO2, and then you have the emission, an emission factor different for each type of mode, and you can find these emission factors in the methodology. Next, uh, next slide, please. So we're going to go straight to, to one example uh, of transport and storage. So uh, this project intends to build a special transport system to transport large volumes of CO2 by pipeline to the storage site. Uh, the sector classification in this case is EII, other, and CO2, transport and storage. DGIG calculation should be done according to the CCS section, so section three of the methodology. And the reference scenario is the CO2 release to the atmosphere. Uh, again, you see here the equation for the absolute GIG avoidance. So we have the rev release, then minus the project emissions. We have uh, emissions due to the capture process, due to fuel and material use, uh, plus fugitives, venting, etc. The emissions due to the pipeline, uh, which are emissions at support installations, plus fugitives, venting, or leakages. The emissions due to the injection, uh, which are emissions from fuel use at booster station, uh, venting, leakages. And the other emissions due to transport of other times of, or transportation if we have. Um, important to, to notice here, uh, Please don't forget to include any of these uh, any of these elements because if you forget to, to include, for example, the transportation, this will be an error. Or also, if you have a poor methodology to estimate leakages, for instance, uh, a couple of points to note: uh, the applicant shall secure a buyer of the technology and cover the whole life cycle for capture to storage in the submission, which shall be part of the boundaries of GHG emissions avoidance calculation. Companies will be required to monitor and report on emissions across all stages. And then uh, applications can be submitted with or without a consortium, and it is up to the applicants and players to organize themselves and split the revenues and liabilities in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Another example, uh, in this case, we have a cement plant with CO2 capture and storage. So uh, this project intends to build, uh, to produce cement in an innovative way and capture and store some of the CO2 released. The sector classification in this case would be EII. Uh, the sector would be cement and lime, and the principal product is cement. The GG calculations should follow the energy intensive industries, 
section, which is section two of the methodology, with the CCS, uh, which is section three, integrated. And we're going to see now how we do this. Uh, the reference is the cement, uh, cement UTS benchmark. So here you can see the equation of the GHG avoidance, the absolute avoidance um, for the energy industries. So it's the reference emissions minus the project emissions, which where we have, uh, as you have seen in the in the previous presentation, inputs, processes, end of life, combustion, change in use, and non-principal. So in this case, uh, in the processes box of the project scenario, uh, you will have to include all the EII uh, processes involved in the production of cement, but you also will need to include the CCS part, and this is where it goes, where the credit for CCS, for CCS goes. So how do you claim this credit? Um, first of all, you need to introduce two things. You need to introduce the full amount of CO2 generated by the project as a positive term, even though some of the CO2 is to be captured, and then the second thing is the CCS credit calculated according to section three of the methodology. So section, the, the CCS section, as a negative term. And how you calculate this negative term? Following the CCS methodology. So rev release, which is the CO2 available in the atmosphere and the absence of the project. Um, and then uh, you need to subtract the project emissions. So capture, transport and storage. Uh, next slide, please. The third example that we're going to see is a waste to energy plant with CO2 capture and storage. Uh, so this project intends to produce bioelectricity from a waste to energy plant and capture and store some of the CO2 released. The sector classification in this case would be EII, other and electricity would be the principal product. And the GHG calculation would follow the renewable energy section, section four of the methodology, with the CCS section integrated in a similar way uh, as we did for the cement case. Uh, the reference is this, uh, is in this case the expected 2030 electricity mix. So uh, here we have the GHG emissions avoidance equation for the renewable energies. So reference emissions minus project emissions. And again, uh, in the project emissions, we need to include all the, ref all the project emissions due to the production of bioelectricity. But you need to introduce also uh, the, CCS, uh, the CCS credit, the CCS part. And again, we have two things to include. The amount, let's say that in this case, the waste that we are using can be a, a mix of biogenic and fossil. So if we have this case, the amount of biogenic CO2 generated by the project, we need to include it here with an emission factor of zero and the fossil CO2 uh, generated as a positive term, even though some of this CO2 is to be captured. And then uh, the second term is the CCS credit, uh, calculated according to the CCS section, section three of the methodology, as a negative term in the same way as we did before. So the re release, which would be uh, the CO2 that will release in the absence of the project, in this case, fossil and biogenic, and the uh, project, and then subtract the project emissions due to capture, transport, and storage. It is very important here, we mentioned uh, in the beginning of this presentation that uh, the credit, uh, so the CCS section does not differentiate be between biogenic and fossil CO2. The credit goes to the meeting facility. And uh, so we have seen how in the first part, when we say the amount of biogenic CO2 generated by the project, we record it with an emission factor of zero. This is where the credit goes for the biogenic CO2, not in the second part. Uh, so please be careful with this because this can uh, this can be an error if you double count these biogenic emissions in in both terms. Uh, in this case, if we have biogenic CO2 that is being emitted and we are capturing it, uh, there is a possibility to claim net carbon removals if the project emissions are negative. We're going to see uh, uh, this more in detail. These net carbon removals. Uh, next slide, please. And then this, uh, this is the last example, uh, which is a director capture plant uh, with storage. So the project is to remove the CO2 from ambient air and store it. The sector classification is energy intensive industries. Uh, the sector is other and the product is CO2 storage. And the GHG calculation follows the CCS section of the methodology, which is section three. And the reference is the CO2 removed from the atmosphere. Um, here you have the equation of the absolute GHG avoidance. This is the, the equation of the CCS section, where you have the rev release, which is the amount of CO2 removed from the atmosphere, minus the uh, project emissions. Again, the fuel and material use, fugitives, venting, uh, leakages, etc. 
Uh, in this case, for direct air capture, pro uh, direct air capture projects, uh, the relative GHG emission avoidance is set by default at 100% uh, to grant direct air capture projects, direct air capture with carbon storage projects with an advantage over conventional CCS. So you need to record this uh, in, your, in your submission. Uh, there is a possibility to claim also net camera removals in this case uh, if the overall project emissions are negative. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now we're going to have a look at this uh, at the net, at net camera removals. Uh, there are a few general rules that we introduced before. Uh, to claim net camera removals, the total project emission should be negative. The negative emissions can only be claimed, excluding any credit for time operations. And non principal products are not allowed to be the only source of negative emissions in the project. Uh, so we have basically two types of projects that could claim net cover removals. Uh, projects without permanent geological storage, so we're talking about CCU projects here. In this case, uh, what you need to put in the in the net cover removal tab is the relative GHG emissions avoidance that you have already calculated. Then uh, for projects with permanent geological storage, there will be two things that you need to calculate. The first one is the total project emissions that should be negative. And for director capture and storage projects, they would be uh, minus the absolute GHG avoidance. And for uh, bioenergy projects with CCS, uh, they would be the project emissions with the CCS term integrated, as we have seen in the example before of the waste to energy plant. The second thing that you will need to calculate is the relative net carbon removals, uh, which are given by by the uh, the formula that you see in the slide, uh, the absolute GHG avoidance of the CCS part divided by the rate release. Uh, be careful because this is not necessarily the same value as the relative GHG emissions avoidance explaining the main methodology. In this case, for director capture projects with CCS. Um, we have said that we set the relative uh, GHG emissions avoidance at 100%, but uh, for the credit of net carbon removals, you need to uh, calculate exactly the value that you uh, that you will be obtaining calculating the relative GHG emission avoidance, and that will be the value that you will have to report in the net carbon removals. We're going to see an example an example after. Uh, for bioenergy for BEX uh, projects. Um, the numerator of the formula, so the absolute GHG avoidance of the CCS part, needs to be calculated based only on the biogenic fraction of the CO2 emitted by the plant. So uh, the REV release in the equation to calculate the absolute GHG avoidance in this case should consider only the biogenic fraction of the CO2 that is released. And that will be captured by the CCS facility because uh, credit cannot be claimed for the fossil fraction of the CO2 emitted. Uh, let's think, for instance, about a waste to energy plant that uses waste uh, from fossil and biogenic sources. You can only claim net carbon removals on the biogenic part. And then the denominator is the rate release, which is calculated as the sum of the total CO2 emissions by the plant. In this case, the total is uh, biogenic and fossil CO2, if you have both. And that will be captured by the CCS facility. Uh, so now, uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, and I'm going to be showing you an example uh, from, from the Excel tool. Um, Uh, okay, I hope you see this. Uh, okay, so we have in this case this is the um, this is the CCS uh, Excel tool. Uh, just to be very quick to go through the through the tabs, you have an overview tab here with general information, a summary tab where the information of the absolute avoidance and the relative avoidance will be transferred from the other tabs where you did the calculations. Then you have here the reference emissions, where you need to calculate uh, the rev release, so the emissions in the absence of the project. And then you have here the project emissions, where you, fa you have all the terms. You have the capture, pipeline, injection, transport, uh, yeah, those, those three. Then you have some the conversion factors for, uh, for the three modes of transportation. Uh, and then the other tabs are, are similar for, the, for all the other tools. And uh, the net cover removals. This is how it looks like. It's the same information that I presented you in the slide. 
this is the the information that you will have to provide the results uh, for the scoring. Uh, and then here in the inside the CCS tool, you will find the example here. So in this case, uh, we have a project that consists of the capture of, this is a director capture uh, uh, with geological storage example. So this project consists of the capture of, of CO2 from ambient air using director capture technology. The CO2 is extracted from the ambient air using a series of chemical reactions and the non-CO2 uh, gases present, present in the air will be returned to the environment. All energy use in the capture installation, including for liquefaction of the CO2, is supplied by solar panels installed at the site. The project will be located by the North Sea, uh, the North Sea coast, within 6,000 kilometers of the storage site and will include buffer storage. The liquefied CO2 uh, will be transported by marine vessels uh, and no, no onshore transportation of CO2 is required. It is envisioned that two transfers will occur each year, a smaller one in the first semester and a larger one in the second semester. It is assumed a 30% of the CO2 captured is sent in the first travel and the rest in the second. It is estimated that 1% of the CO2 is lost in each point of transfer from the capture point to the storage site and that 25,000 tons of CO2 are captured from ambient air annually. CO2 is pumped into the storage site using electricity generated by liquefied petroleum gases. Approximately 5,000 tons of CO2 is released by the combustion of the LPG each year. Assuming an emission factor of 63.1 uh, tons of CO2 per terajoule as per monitoring and reporting regulation. Estimates are based on, um, on measurements undertaken for six transfers realized during pilot phase. So uh, let's have a look at the assumptions first. Uh, in the tab assumptions that you will find here in the Excel tool, you need to report all your assumptions. So uh, in this case, uh, the CO2 leakage uh, is assumed to be 1%. And this is estimated by the supplier of the equipment. This happens at each point of transfer. And then here is the annual CO2 capture, which is 25,000 tons of CO2 per year. And here, in these results, we have the amount of CO2 that passes to each uh, to each point of transfer. There is 1% lost in each step. So this is the amount that enters in the marine vessel. This is the, the amount that reaches the injection site and the amount that reaches the storage site. The distance travel is 6,000 kilometers. Uh, and there is a 30% uh, CO2 uh, transported in the first semester and 70% in the second semester. So let's have a look at the tab reference emissions, which would be uh, what you would need to report here in this tab, in the reference emissions tab. You have here the red release, which is the CO2 that is transferred to the uh, capture installation. It's measured in tons of CO2, and the value is 25,000 every year. That is simple. This is, uh, this is the only reference emission. So now going to the project emissions, you will have to report this in the project emissions tab here. And you have here the different elements that you need to consider. So we have the project capture, uh, which are these. These emissions are the only emissions in this case for the capture process. And these emissions are calculated, uh, taking into account this 1% of, uh, of CO2 that is lost in the, in, the, in the transfer points. Then uh, you have emissions due to injection. You have two types of emissions. The first one is due to this 1% that is lost again. And then you have these emissions that are because of the uh, LPG that is being uh, combusted for the injection process. Then uh, we don't have any transportation by road or by rail. So the only transportation we have is maritime. And we have two parts. The first part is uh, for the first semester and the second part is for the second semester. Here, uh, we calculate the, the amount, the, the number of kilometers that we are going to be transporting the CO2. This is the uh, amount of CO2 that is going to be transported, applying a 30% that applies for the first semester. And this is uh, the calculation of these two. And we do the same thing here for the second semester, the amount of uh, um, the kilometers that we are going to be transporting the CO2, the amount uh, of CO2, in this case, the 70%, and we multiply these two terms. And at the end here, in this case, these amounts of CO2 are the same as these ones because they are already expressed in tons of CO2. 
Here, these are the emission factors for the different modes of transportation. So uh, 0.03 is for maritime. This would be for road and for, uh, and for rail. So at the end, this is the total amount of uh, tons of CO2 that we will be having during the 10 years uh, of the project. And this is going to be uh, transferred here. So we have the project capture, so the emissions due to the capture, the emissions due to the injection, and the emissions due to the transport, the maritime part. Uh, one thing in very important, so this is a pivot table, uh, not in the example, but in the, in the project emissions. And every time you do a change here in the table, please remember to uh, refresh this pivot table, because otherwise your changes here will not be will not be reflected here, so this is very important, so that everything is transferred in the right way. And um, yeah, this would be, well, this would be, okay, um, here in the summary tab, in this tab that I showed you before, uh, you're going to see the absolute GSG emission avoidance, uh, which is going to be the reference minus the project emissions, and the relative emission avoidance, which is the uh, absolute emissions divided by the reference emissions. So what did we say? That for director capture projects, the relative GHG emissions avoidance will be set at 100%. Uh, applicants from such projects shall disregard the calculated figures and fill in the application form with 100%. However, this 59% is going to be useful because this is what we are going to have to put for the net carbon removals. So if we go to the net carbon removals tab, uh, we said that for director capture projects, uh, we need to calculate two things. The total project emissions that are here and are uh, defined as minus the absolute GHG avoidance. And uh, we have seen here in the example our absolute uh, GHG avoidance is this value. So in the net carbon removals, uh, it will be minus this value. And then this 59%, uh, if we go to the net carbon removal tab, uh, the relative net carbon removals uh, should be calculated uh, as with this formula, which is in the case of director capture, the exact value that you would be obtaining and calculating the relative GAG emission avoidance. So this 59% would go here. So here would be the minus absolute GAG avoidance, and here this 59%, and you will be scored uh, according to these, uh, to these values for the net carbon removals part. And this is all uh, for this part. Um, so I think we can pass to, to the questions. Thank you, Rosiu. Um, this was uh, very useful. And just to underline uh, once again that uh, this is a new way to calculate net carbon removal. So if uh, you are such a project, if you're intending to submit such a project, please read the instructions uh, carefully that I included in the calculation template and uh, go back to the recording to listen to the explanation if necessary. So we haven't received too, too many questions, but uh, nonetheless, they, there is one question, which is um, in the call portal, only one GHG Excel can be uploaded. For CCS projects where transport is included, where can the transport GHG calculation file be uploaded? Rocio. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, probably maybe this question came before the presentation, but as you have seen, the transport of CO2 in CCS project is included in the project emissions under the CCS section. So they will be reported in the CCS Excel tool, as you have seen. If you have, for example, a project, uh, an EII project or a REST project that includes a CCS component, the CCS credit goes in the processes box of the project scenario if we have a project in, uh, in the intensive industry sector with a CCS component. And if we have a REST project with a CCS component, then this goes in the project emissions. So in any case, uh, we have seen in the, um, in the case of waste to energy plant and in the case of cement, uh, uh, the cement plant, that these are recorded within the, the tools of EII and the and res. So they will be you wouldn't need to to include uh, uh, two Excel two Excel tools. Just one is fine. So I think that, that answers. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, with this question, we will close the session on carbon capture and storage. 
and we will restart at uh, 4.30 with the next uh, session on renewable energy. So we're having a short break. We managed to catch up as the carbon capture and storage session and methodology is not as complicated as the previous one. So let's reconvene at 4.30.
So, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, we are ready to start with the next session on renewable electricity, heat and cooling, including production facilities of components for renewable energy. So, Michele, you will go through these uh, slides. Yes. Uh, so now we are going to uh, go through some examples. Uh, we have seen uh, the, quest the equation uh, that is specific for the case of renewable electricity, heating and cooling uh, projects uh, in, the, in the general session. Uh, now we, we can try to see a bit uh, how uh, a specific example would, would look like. Uh, let's take uh, uh, a project that foresees the innovative conversion of uh, biogenic residues into heat, which will be then sold to uh, a nearby cement industry, currently purchasing heat from a coal-fired uh, uh, CHP plant, uh, combust, uh, combined heat and power plant, and uh, to the city where the project is based as district heating. So, uh, this project, this kind of project would be classified under EII other heat and uh, actually bio heat. Uh, the methodology section uh, would be, however, the renewable energy sources uh, section, the section four of the methodology. And uh, uh, the reference when setting the reference scenario for such a project, uh, we have to consider the heat supplied by natural gas boilers. So please note that the reference here is not what is actually currently being done, uh, but uh, the methodology is indicating clearly uh, that for heat, the reference is natural gas uh, combustion in boilers. So, uh, the equation would then uh, develop uh, uh, develops as, as, um, as is indicated below. So, the difference between the reference and the project in the next 10 years would be uh, mainly indicated uh, for the reference would will have the heat, as we indicated above, and the, for the project, we will have the emissions coming from the on-site activities, which means that for the reference, uh, we had, it will be simply the, the heat, and we will have next slide to, to explain how to calculate that. For project, <clears throat> we have uh, basically the quantity of fossil fuels combusted in stationary and in mobile sources, and uh, uh, in, uh, in addition to the uh, electricity uh, consumed and imported uh, from the project. Uh, we have to uh, also consider that, of course, the electricity emissions factor uh, for the electricity consumed by the pro project uh, is zero, but still electricity needs to be uh, reported in your, uh, in your project. So this is why we uh, spelled out also this, this term here. Uh, so uh, these are a bit the, the term that will make up the emissions for the uh, on, on, uh, for the for the project. Uh, next slide, please. For the reference, the heat will be calculated basically as the multiplication of the installed capacity. Uh, by the plant load factor in percentage, uh, that is the plant's capacity utilization, uh, multiplied by the operating hours in year and divided by the efficiency. Next slide, please. So, uh, this, uh, what we saw was uh, an example uh, on how to make the calculations for an individual plant. Basically, a, a single plant delivering um, energy uh, instead of a fossil one. So it was a, a, a single case. However, we, we uh, under the Innovation Fund, it is also possible, as we saw, 
to submit projects where uh, there is uh, the production of components for renewable energy sources. And similarly also for energy storage, we will see. So for uh, this case, basically there will be a, a manufacturing plant where a certain element, a certain part of a renewable energy source will be produced in a large amount. And this part will be installed in a number of uh, renewable energy sources plants uh, across uh, Europe. In this case, the calculation will be done by considering the plants where this component uh, is going to be installed in the following 10 years. Normally, for the calculation of this, of this type of project, the, the emissions due to the manufacturing are out of the scope of the greenhouse gas avoidance calculation. So basically, this element uh, uh, is not part of the calculation. The calculation will be done by considering the emissions of the uh, reference uh, energy that would have been produced and uh, with the consequent emissions, and the project, which is the uh, all the amount of uh, renewable energy plants that uh, are going to be put into service in the next 10 years, thanks to the manufacturing of this component. Next slide, please. So, uh, to get into the detail of one example uh, of this case, where we have the production of a component, which is then uh, installed into a, a number of, uh, of plant. In this case, we consider, for example, uh, the production of an innovative blade for use in floating wind power plants. Uh, the innovative blade has a higher capacity factor than a conventional blade. So, uh, in this case, uh, the classification of this project would be renewable energy, wind energy, electricity, and the methodology uh, would be the, the again the section four of the greenhouse gas methodology, and uh, for uh, the, the the calculation is uh, we can see how the equation would uh, would expand. So we uh, we have to consider in this case also a, a peculiar element for this type of project, which multiply basically the uh, the difference between the reference and the project by the number of uh, elements produced and actually put into service and uh, a factor which is the innovative uh, indicated in the equation here as CS, which is the innovative component cost as a fraction of the total capital cost. Basically, uh, the, there is an allocation of the avoidance to the, mm, the, com the component manufa manufacturing uh, based on this fraction. So if your, uh, in this case, the blade, uh, the blades uh, have a 20% uh, uh, fractional cost of the, over the total capital cost, then the avoidance attributed to uh, the manufacturing of the blades will be the 20% uh, of, the, of the total uh, emission avoidance. Uh, so the, again, uh, I want to stress this point because it's key for this type of project. Uh, it is very important to highlight uh, when uh, this type of project is submitted, which is the innovative component costs. And uh, we understand the innovative component as uh, the component which is as a whole delivered by the manufacturing, basically the component which is leaving the manufacturing plant as a whole, which is then installed into a, into a full plant. So you see uh, then uh, how this uh, uh, calculation would, uh, would evolve. Uh, for the reference, uh, there will be the emissions factor uh, for the uh, reference electricity, for which is the 2030 value uh, Consider uh, The reference indeed is the electricity supplied by the EU grid mix in 2030. This is 
very important for this type of project. Um, multiplied by uh, the CS, the factor, uh, the power, the electrical power installed uh, cum cumulatively over the 10 years, and uh, uh, the load factor and uh, the, uh, the operating hours. There will be a number of assumptions uh, in, this, uh, in this case, like many other projects, and all this needs to be uh, uh, thoroughly uh, um, I mean, they have to be demonstrated with uh, with uh, supporting evidence. Uh, so, in this case, we are saying that the average capacity factor is 45%. Uh, uh, the assumption for operating hours are uh, 8,400 hours, uh, and then there is a uh, a sum for all the uh, total uh, capacity installed in the years one to ten. Uh, and then there will be uh, uh, this will be subtracted by uh, with the, with the on-site uh, uh, total emissions. So this uh, this uh, uh, example is important for uh, well the reason I said in terms of uh, specificity uh, because it is of this kind of production of components. Uh, it is. Of course, it is possible also in these cases to uh, have uh, uh, unrealistic and uh, non-evidenced number of blades sold or uh, components which are not sold uh, uh, in, the, in the right market. So uh, these are elements which can uh, uh, trigger some, some errors. Uh, the applicant will have also to demonstrate that the existence of a buyer of the technology. This is a, for this type of project is a, is a is a key element. Uh, for example, a company a company that will run the floating wind power plant. Normally, this is uh, accepted uh, through the existence of a of a contract, for example, or a letter of intent where this is clearly where the intention is clearly uh, stated. Uh, this is to ensure the accountability over the promised uh, greenhouse gas avoidance. Applicants will also have to present the rationale uh, for the projected performance of the component as well as of other components that will be needed at the power plant. So, uh, uh, we will see this example a bit more in detail uh, in a few minutes. Uh, uh, by following uh, uh, what we have in the examples. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we, we can go to uh, the example and see uh, a bit more in detail this. Can I share my screen? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, so this is the Excel tool uh, that uh, will be used uh, by applicants to uh, submit an application. It will be essentially uh, composed by the uh, overview sheet. Uh, we will have a summary where all the data will be reported and where some of the data can be inserted. This is always indicated in color, so the Azure part is where uh, data needs to be inserted. Uh, there will be a summary per year where all the amounts of uh, um, emissions will be indicated year by year as a sum of the total. And this will also be used for uh, monitoring purposes uh, by indicating uh, this is the, the for project uh, that will be selected and for comparison the actual values for the year. Uh, the main uh, sh uh, sheet stops are the reference emissions and project emissions where uh, data for the two cases needs to be inserted again in, the, in these uh, blue cells. The green ones, as indicated by my colleagues, uh, also are the ones 
calculated automatically by the uh, greenhouse gas calculators uh, by using some of the values already introduced in the different cells for the different uh, inputs. In this case, for the reference, uh, uh, there are specific lines for the uh, electricity, uh, for uh, the cool and for the heat uh, uh, amount, amounts which are uh, basically replaced by the project. So, uh, in the sheet project emissions, uh, similarly we will have uh, some values to be inserted by the applicants for the specific uh, case. You will see that there are many uh, or some of these entries which are not appropriate for your project. You have to fill in only the specific ones. Uh, we will see then the example. Uh, for the specific case of uh, the uh, production uh, the, for the manufacturing components projects, this can be uh, this needs to be done also by inserting a specific uh, number of components per year, which is set at one for projects which are normal project, not, not manufacturing of component project, and uh, also for the uh, CS factor that I explained in the, in the previous slides. Also that one is pertinent only for this type of project. Um, then we, uh, there are also some tools uh, uh, that are available for, for applicants, which uh, is already indicated in the, in the Excel, which are the, <clears throat> some conversion factors that we are giving that might be useful. Um, then I would like then to go to the uh, example which is the same we saw in the last slide, but with a bit more detail that we can go through. So, as we said, uh, the project envisage uh, building a production facility for innovative blades to be installed in floating wind energy power plants. Uh, let's assume 12 megawatt each tower, three blades per tower, which will thereby achieve a capacity factor of 45% at offshore sites with sufficient wind resources. The foreseen scale-up of production is to produce blades for wind energy power plants with a capacity of 120 megawatt in year one, 360 in year two, 600 in the following years. So this means a total uh, of uh, 1,320 blades for wind energy power plants with a total capacity of 5,280 megawatt produced during the first 10 year. Uh, indicative buyers for the blades uh, have been identified and there is the prelim preliminary agreements on long term. Uh, the total capacity referred to the nacelle capacity uh, or other components need necessary to build uh, are already available on the market. So there is a certainty that these uh, uh, plants, a relative certainty that these plants will be built. The installation of blades is scheduled to start in well, 2022. It is assumed the plant will count with a small inland base, 20 square meters, that will consume a little bit of electricity. No vehicles are foreseen at the site, but a speedboat will be used for maintenance purposes. So, uh, the, as, as I said, this will be uh, uh, a renewable energy, wind energy project uh, with the product will be non-dispatchable electricity, specifically, uh, and uh, the electricity, the reference will be the 2030. So, uh, some specific figures will be uh, needed to be introduced by the applicant uh, in the overview tab. In this case, we inserted, well, the start of operation years, uh, the principal project uh, product, sorry, the uh, installed annual capacity, which will be 600, uh, uh, the added components at full scale, 150 blades per tower, or three uh, installed power in each tower, 12 
uh, power per blade ratio four and total install power. He's uh, I've already mentioned that. So there will be all these uh, figures to be uh, specified in in this. Uh, uh, first part, which is the overview, which correspond to what we have in the overview tab here. So uh, then, coming back to the example, uh, some assumptions will be also uh, indicated by, uh, by the applicant, in this case, for example, area of the site, uh, electricity consumption, etc. And then the, uh, the main uh, elements to be filled in, sorry, here I had a problem, to be filled in uh, by an applicant are the reference uh, and the project uh, scenario values. So in this case, uh, there will be an indication of the megawatt hour pro uh, produced uh, per year, so uh, this will be indicated in the reference, and uh, this would result into a total amount of um, CO2 avoided. And then in the project there will be some, uh, sorry, of course, uh, given the type of project, there will be also an, indi an indication of the amount of uh, uh, components produced per year and also the uh, uh, relative uh, C, uh, CS factor, so the component costs uh, factor as a, a fraction of the total co capital cost, which will remain constant uh, during the 10 years while the amount of, uh, uh, the cumulative amount of, uh, of plants uh, or megawatt in operation will increase during the 10 years. And then the total uh, of the CO2 avoided will be reported here in the green cells. Uh, this will be also uh, combined with the project emissions, uh, which will basically only uh, the emissions combusted in the mobile source and the electricity con uh, consumed, which will actually uh, come with a zero emissions factor, so uh, its uh, emissions will be uh, will have to be reported for, for transparency and uh, to make the project comprehensible also uh, to evaluators, but uh, its emission will uh, uh, not uh, appear also in the calculated cells because uh, the, the electricity emission factor will, will be always zero. So, this is uh, uh, in a nutshell how the project, uh, this project would look like. Then we'll, this will generate uh, in the summary in, uh, automatically the accumulated greenhouse gas emission avoidance. Uh, and also the, uh, the reference emissions, the, the project emissions, so all this will be automatically calculated. As you, as you can see, you have to uh, really insert the essential element of your, uh, your project and uh, everything else will be calculated uh, somehow uh, automatically. So, um, then for this, I think is uh, somehow what I wanted to, to report. Uh, also, uh, this will be reflected uh, in, the, in these cells, showing that there will be almost a 100% uh, uh, emissions uh, reduction. So I think we can uh, uh, close the, this part uh, of the tool here, and we can move to uh, question and answers uh, for this session, if, uh, if any. Thank you, Michele. Uh, this was very clear and uh, I hope really useful uh, going through this uh, detailed example. Uh, actually, we have, uh, we are showing now a question which is more related to energy storage, I believe. 
Uh, so perhaps uh, we wait <laughs> until the next session. We don't. We have uh, received one question uh, specific to renewables, but as the question was not completely clear, we have asked uh, uh, the person sending it to to clarify the question and send it to the help desk. Uh, which means that, uh, well, uh, the methodology and the explanations uh, seem relatively clear. So we hope this is indeed the case, and uh, applicants will have. Uh, will do these calculations with ease. Uh, so we will stop now for a bit of a longer break uh, because we have the next session starting at 5.15. Uh, it will be on energy storage and it will be our last uh, session for today. Thank you.
So we can start our last uh, session for today, uh, which is dedicated to the calculations for energy storage uh, projects. Michele, you will go through a few slides and an example. Yes, thank you, Maria. So now uh, we will see some uh, specific calculations uh, and examples for uh, the case of energy storage, for which we saw uh, before the main uh, equation. Uh, before that, uh, some uh, I would like to uh, provide you with some uh, key examples uh, of uh, manifest errors. Uh, uh, for the case for the specific case of energy storage so uh, one aspect that can uh, lead to a, a manifest error is when uh, in the case of an energy type other than electricity stored uh, uh, but in this project the emissions associated with the storage input have not been uh, correctly taken into account uh, another one is when an emission factor other than the default is used for the storage input, but no sufficient evidence provided for using it uh, is given in the application. Uh, third one is uh, possible is uh, when the greenhouse gas emission avoidance are counted twice in the, the two parts of a hybrid project. We will have also an example for a hybrid project. Uh, the, all these are uh, examples, so uh, of course it may, may be uh, possible that these are manifest error when they, they result in a significant deviation from the current calculation. Now, uh, coming to a, a specific example where we can see some uh, uh, details of the equation for uh, this type of projects. For uh, considering a hydrogen storage project, uh, an innovative hydrogen storage facility, for example, using a liquid organic hydrogen carrier uh, that is used to recover hydrogen for, from a byproduct of one chemical plant and then store it in a tank by replacing fossil hydrogen. So, uh, the, the classification for this would be energy storage, other energy storage, hydrogen. Uh, the methodology section would be section five of the greenhouse gas methodology. And the, the reference uh, in this case would be the ETS benchmark for hydrogen production. Uh, this is uh, uh, important to highlight. Mm, we have seen in many cases that uh, the, 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 the choice and the building of the reference scenario is uh, uh, an area where there, there could be a manifest error, uh, especially because this can can, deliver, can lead to a very large uh, variation in the in the calculation. Um, coming to uh, the equation, the usual difference between the reference and the project in the next 10 years uh, becomes, in this case, uh, the reference of the energy uh, would be the calculated as the uh, energy from uh, the output from the storage multiplied by the emissions factor uh, of the hydrogen. Uh, uh, then, uh, added uh, uh, with uh, energy out uh, uh, as, as in form of heat, output in form of heat, if any. Uh, of course, this will be uh, calculated as the sum over the years, multiplied by uh, the emissions factor for uh, heat output. And for the project, this will become uh, the energy input uh, for uh, the energy input for in, in form of hydrogen multiplied by the emissions factor for hydrogen input and uh, added with the energy input as heat multiplied by the emissions factor uh, of heat input. So this uh, difference will make up for the, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas uh, absolute uh, avoidance. 
The applicant can provide, of course, additional information on the source of the stored hydrogen, but does not need to, be, uh, to do so. That's uh, uh, voluntary on his side. Uh, there is a, a, a specific a quantitative version of this example that uh, can be seen. We will go through it uh, later on. Next slide, please. Also, in the case of energy storage, we we could consider uh, well the applicants could consider submitting uh, production facilities of components projects. Uh, for example, in this case, we see an, um, a project uh, producing batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, in this case, the project envisages the production of innovative batteries to be used in electric vehicles, uh, which will enable uh, to replace long-distance internal combustion engine uh, cars. So, uh, in this case, the classification would be energy storage, manufacturing of components, batteries. The methodology section would be the section 5 as, uh, for energy storage. And the reference in this case will be cars uh, running on diesel fuel uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, a key point for this type of uh, project, as I mentioned also for the renewable energy uh, similar project, is that the applicant will have to demonstrate the existence of a buyer of the technology. This is a key point, and uh, often we have seen some uh, some issues around this aspect so uh, if you plan to to submit uh, this type of project be sure that you have a, a very good supporting document proving that there is somebody a company uh, intending to buy your uh, produce item uh, for example, a company that will install the batteries in electric vehicles, replacing uh, specific, uh, the specific vehicles. So, uh, this is to ensure that uh, this, uh, the, the overall uh, project and calculations uh, could, be, could be accepted. Uh, so, applicants will also have to present the rationale for the projected performance of the batteries. For cars, an average travel distance of uh, this amount uh, should be assumed, so 4,300 kilometers per year. Uh, <clears throat> this, is, of course, it's an average, uh, average uh, value that uh, needs, needs to be uh, assumed. Also, in this case, like we saw in the in the other one for uh, renewable energy, uh, in the calculation, the applicant needs to uh, to indicate the number, the amount, total amount uh, per year of components produced, uh, multiplied by the uh, specific factors that we introduce in the calculation for this type of project, the innovative, innovative components cost as a fraction of the total capital cost. Uh, in this case, the calculation will be essentially uh, done by indicating the reference energy for, the, for each year, calculated as the number of components uh, cumulatively uh, done until that year, uh, multiplied by the factor we mentioned, uh, multiplied by the emissions factor uh, for the uh, transport uh, for diesel fuel internal combustion engines. Uh, this, uh, and then of course, uh, multiplied by the by the amount of energy. So that means you have to in introduce the amount uh, of this uh, distance that these um, uh, cars will run, the 14,300 kilometers per year, multiplied by the assumed fossil fuel efficiency of the replaced vehicle in each year. So this uh, multiplication would uh, basically uh, um, result in the uh, green, in the greenhouse gas absolute emission avoidance uh, by um, mm, 
by considering that this uh, each year this the amount of vehicles will increase so the total over the 10 years will be not uh, just uh, the, the, uh, the multiplication of 10 by the number by by the uh, emissions avoided each year because these emissions will increase over the year together with the amount of uh, equipment with which will be uh, installed and put into service uh, each year. So it will be a, a never growing number. Next slide, please. So uh, um, to conclude, this will be uh, another uh, Example: Another example on uh, a hybrid project combining uh, a floating photovoltaic plant with an annual production of 100 gigawatt hour per, per year, uh, combined with an innovative electricity storage, uh, having an input of 50 gigawatt hour per year and an output of 45 gigawatt hour per year, uh, to provide a controllable renewable energy storage electricity generation. That's the main purpose. So this, the classification would be hybrid, but still there would be the need to indicate a specific sector. Uh, the methodology section would be uh, uh, to follow would be both the renewable energy and the energy storage part, section four and five of the greenhouse gas methodology. And uh, the reference to choose uh, would be twofold. For the rest part, would be the electricity supplied by the 2030 grid mix, the specific factor that we indicated in the methodology section four, and also in section one, you can find it as a summary. For the energy storage part, uh, for the electricity storage output, the reference would be the natural, a natural gas turbine, which is uh, chosen in the methodology as a specific uh, uh, reference in the case of dispatchable electricity, basically. So, um, in the calculation, uh, of course, we can go also um, highlight a bit the which are possible errors in this case, potential manifest error could be double counting, of, all, of course, between the two parts. Uh, if this cannot easily uh, cannot be easily re be removed in the calculation, um, um, while a potential theoretical error could be to use uh, a, a wrong emission factor that can easily be corrected. So, uh, if we come to the calculation, there will be the component coming from the rest part and the component for the storage part. And then the two parts need to be uh, summed. Uh, so for the, for the renewable, renewable energy part, the, the reference would be, as, as we said, the electricity, which is produced, so which is exported by the project. Uh, multiplied by the emissions factor for uh, for the 2030 electricity mix and uh, uh, for the exported amount of energy of course you have to uh, subtract the amount which is absorbed by by the uh, by the um, uh, energy storage part of the plant so here is specifically where a double counting needs to be avoided uh, for the energy storage part, uh, you have to consider as a reference the output of energy or coming from uh, the storage, so the 45 gigawatt hour per year, multiplied by the, em uh, the emissions factor of the, this case for the energy storage output, which we said is the natural gas turbine. So. Uh, note that in this case, the two uh, uh, electricity emissions factor are different. Uh, this is very clearly reflected in, uh, in a table we have in section, even in section one of the methodology, I think it's table 1.3, if I'm not wrong, where 
the different emission, uh, uh, emissions factor for electricity are spelled out for the different type of projects. Uh, this is different because uh, this is uh, considered uh, that the while for uh, non-dispatchable electricity it is taken the average uh, 2030 uh, emissions factor for uh, coming from the grid in 2030. For the case of energy storage, uh, having a, a specific uh, uh, controllable uh, feed-in, then uh, the, the reference is chosen uh, as the natural gas turbine having a higher, uh, which is currently used as a peak power plant for uh, dispatchable electricity, so this is uh, having a higher uh, emissions factor. So uh, the data that needs to be introduced are the annual PV generation in each year, uh, the annual energy storage input, and the annual energy storage output. So these are the, the basic uh, figures that would be needed in this case. Next slide, please. So now we can go through uh, briefly uh, the tool for the energy storage, where we also have an example. I will share my screen. Um, <clears throat> so. This is the, uh, the specific tool for the energy storage. is uh, It's an Excel file, still combining all the tabs that we have seen also for other cases with the overview, the summary, the summary per year, the reference emissions, and the project emissions. In these two cases, we have, again, in the reference, the entries which are typical for energy storage, uh, all of them are present, so uh, normally not all of them needs to be filled in by, by an applicant, but only the one uh, pertinent for the specific project. Uh, and this is uh, basically indicating the, the energy output for uh, hydrogen, for heat, for electricity. And uh, similarly, the uh, the duration of the uh, of the certain services that can be uh, delivered by the the project, because some of these uh, projects could also deliver services. And in the project emissions, we will have uh, the list of possible. Um, figures needed to represent the emissions of uh, the project. Coming to the example that I would like to show you now, this is uh, what we have seen also in the previous slides. So uh, we consider a project in, uh, that envisages building a liquid organic hydrogen carrier plant in order to store hydrogen from a chemical plant, which would otherwise be uh, unused. The heat required for the hydrogenation reaction will be sourced from the chemical plant's heat supply, and uh, the carrier will be transported to another chemical plant uh, and then uh, used. Uh, the installation is scheduled to start in 2022, uh, so and there are some uh, uh, on-site use of electricity and natural gas, uh, which can be omitted for, for the small scale anyway. So, um, the classification of the project is energy storage. Uh, it is... Uh, other energy storage and hydrogen heat as a product. And uh, the, the section to follow is section five. Uh, the reference would be hydrogen produced in the conventional way, which means using as a figure the ETS product benchmark. And uh, again, 
Uh, we have a tab overview that we saw uh, at the beginning of this file, which will be filled. Uh, in this case, some uh, uh, values will be indicated for the annual storage capacity for hydrogen, the annual st storage capacity for heat, input-output efficiency for hydrogen, including storage losses, and input-output efficiency for heat, including storage losses. So some efficiency values are requested to properly fill in this. And also, but this, as we said, will be omitted in a small, a small scale project, the on-site uh, values. So for then for the reference, uh, some values will be introduced for uh, basically for the reference energy for uh, the output of heat and the output of hydrogen with the different values introduced for the years, which will be then automatically calculated uh, into uh, emissions per year and then sum up into the total. Uh, the values for the various factors are already inserted in the in the file, uh, so that this can be, as, as you see in the, the column screen just before the the list of the years. Uh, then this will uh, produce the total for the reference. And then there will be the total for the uh, for the project. As I as I said, there, there is a kind of leniency for small scale projects, uh, which are entitled not to uh, monitor certain on-site uh, emissions. Uh, otherwise, this can be in any case reported, but uh, it's not an obligation. Uh, so it is possible to indicate this uh, natural gas consumption and electricity consumption on site. So this uh, will result in an automatic calculation for uh, basically the accumulated greenhouse gas emission avoidance, in this case resulting in uh, basically 500,000 uh, tons of CO2 as a total, and resulting also in a 77% uh, uh, greenhouse gas relative uh, emission avoidance. All this will be calculated by considering the values introduced in the blue cell by applicants and uh, by maintaining the fixed one in the green uh, cell, which are introduced uh, already in the tools. With this, I would uh, conclude and pass the floor to Maria and maybe uh, remaining ready for the uh, question and answer session. Thank you, Michele, for these uh, explanations, uh, how to do calculations of energy storage projects and uh, all the useful tips uh, that you have provided. So we have uh, one question uh, which uh, we can relate to, en to a possible energy storage project, uh, which is uh, for a project on battery manufacturing for sea transport. What greenhouse gas can we claim? Those linked to vessels navigating on EU waters or those linked to EU vessels and or? So. Um, we, pro well, we tried to extract uh, exactly what was the, the point of uh, the, the question. We believe that section five of the methodology provides a single emission factor to be used for cases in which an energy storage project supplied electricity for use in non-rail vehicles, which seems to be the case, because the, in the question it is mentioned vessels navigating in new waters. So the non-rail vehicles using batteries running on electricity seems this case. So this is the uh, emissions factor called EF transport, 
uh, detailing table 5.2 and is set at 222.3 grams of CO2 per megajoule of electricity supplied. This emission factor should be used for a project as described, even though it is not, uh, let's say, specific to this case. It is somehow a, a, a kind of uh, backup case uh, covering all the non ray vehicle case. It's not specific to the case of marine transport. Uh, in fact, this is based on a diesel fuel replacement, but this is uh, what is set in the, in the methodology for this type of project. Thank you very much. Um, so I believe we have, uh, we don't have any more questions, but we have one last uh, slide for, for JRC before we go to the concluding remarks for the day. So next yes, maybe next slide, please. Yeah, this one. So just to summarize a bit uh, uh, also and to remind that uh, there is uh, um, uh, an help desk uh, open. Uh, so just want to remind you that manifest error automatically fails a proposal. As we mentioned, there, there is an, a quantity that the aspect involved in manifest error, but also a concept, uh, a concept error. So normally the two things combined leads to manifest error. So when you have the feeling that you are not sure uh, about some concept of the methodology and you want to consult us, uh, there is the, the help desk. Uh, questions could be sent to the help desk during the opening period. Uh, we will try to provide as clear answer as possible, but the final responsibility, of course, lies in applicants' hands, but we invite you to provide clear questions, maybe also uh, providing some context of the questions, uh, because uh, it will be very important to better understand uh, what do you mean, uh, context taken from the application, to conclude, uh, from the project files you are developing, uh, so uh, questions to help us must come in uh, as much as possible in a standalone self and explanatory fashion by optionally including uh, any brief application information that may be needed to make the question fully, fully understandable. Uh, with this, I think I closed um, also this part. Thank you very much for this uh, useful uh, reminder and uh, I would also like to underline that it is important not to wait until the last moment with your questions and uh, the preparation of the calculations, of course, of all documents. So, uh, because uh, towards the end of the opening period for the call we get more questions and it's more difficult for us to answer them in time. and. Uh, so if you have any hesitation, please uh, go ahead already now and not uh, in the last days when the help desk will be open. In any case, the help desk closes 10 working days before the, end, uh, before the deadline for the call. So that is uh, on uh, the long session, I hope very useful on greenhouse gas emission avoidance. I would like uh, to thank uh, JRC colleagues for the really good uh, explanations of the methodologies um, and for all the actually useful answers to the help desk questions they provide. I believe uh, we are very helpful to many of the applicants in both calls. Uh, and we will move now to the concluding uh, well words. We have just a few slides to conclude this very, well, quite a long and useful day. Uh, on the small scale call. So, so just to recap uh, what you have already heard in the morning, uh, we are planning actually uh, also some next calls. So we finish now with the currently open call with explanations for the currently open call, but we are already actually working on the planning of the next calls for large scale and for small scale. We continue as, uh, 
as planned and right at the beginning of the program to launch annually one large scale co and one small scale co. So next co that will be open will be large scale co uh, in the, this autumn 22 with an expected deadline for submission spring 23 and expected results in autumn 23. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, to be worked out for this uh, call, but we will be communicating when, whenever these details are ready. And if you are actually a small-scale applicant and you have heard uh, today a lot of uh, interesting, useful information, but maybe you think you're not ready to apply for this currently open small-scale call, there is a next small-scale Co, of course, plant, which will be in spring 23. So don't rush. If you're not ready, prepare your application. It is better for you, it is better for us that you come well prepared. And uh, the expected uh, deadline for this next call will be autumn 23. So much, uh, uh, well, similar to this small scale call, expected results in spring 24. And we will continue like that annually with uh, calls for proposals for both small scale and uh, large scale projects. So a few reminders. Uh, the sessions have been recorded and will, will be available at Cinea website. We will cut all the pauses so you can actually watch just the useful parts. Answers to the questions will be available in Slido. If you have project specific questions, please submit them via the help desk. And very important for us, please fill in the Slido feedback form if you have not filled it yet. And uh, we will make all slides available and uh, all these slides contain very useful links, uh, which some of the relevant li links are on this slide. Um, and uh, on that slide, uh, you have all the information available uh, on DG Climate Action Innovation Fund website, on CINEA website, and most importantly, on the funding and tenders portal. Everything that is related to this call, to the application documents is there. And finally, uh, just uh, to remind what we said in the morning, uh, we are looking to enlarge our database of experts. We are looking for technical experts, GHG experts, financial experts. We are looking also for rapporteurs and quality checkers, so people with more like horizontal knowledge but who can draft uh, reports. And uh, all the information is on CINES website. Don't hesitate to, to put your details in the database. Uh, so, because we, we, need, we need experts, we, we have excellent experts, but we need to expand our database. So that is all for me. Thank you very much to everyone who watched us and most of all, good luck in your applications. Goodbye. <laughs>